Support this podcast. Hit the thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. And make sure you hit the bell so you're alerted on new uploads. Hey, what's up, Goaters? It's Lurk. I just want to go ahead and preface this video was done via Skype call, which we at Lamgo do not like to do Skype call interviews because it gets laggy and I have tried to edit it as best I could. So that brings me to our next topic, our Patreon. If you support the Patreon, you help better the podcast. We can actually get guests in person more often. We can get better equipment. We can get better everything and continue to grow. I'll leave a link in the description below and you can check out our Patreon page. Thanks. All right, welcome back to another installment of the Van Flip podcast. Uh, this week we are sitting here with Chris Hornbrook, uh, most known for his work in Poison the Well, also has dabbled in uh, drumming, uh, studio drumming in LA, and he played drums for Census Failed for a number of years up until about 2018. Uh, currently, he is touring with uh, George Harrison's son. Uh, is it? It's Danny. Yeah, Danny. Danny. Yeah, Danny. And uh, you currently are doing. Um, I think I googled it. Like Electric Light Orchestra, like. ELO? Yeah, ELO, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah. you're like supporting ELO on their current tour. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. So that's what you've mainly kind of been doing, studio drumming and uh, the Census Fail stuff uh, up until recently with uh, Harrison's son. That's mainly what you've been yeah. doing since the uh, hiatus has started from Poison the Well, correct? Yeah, so just to give like a, a little, the little bullet points, like the band went on hiatus. I moved to California just because... I didn't expect really anything additional to happen in Florida. Like we got lucky the first time, but I didn't really think that I was as an individual was going to get lucky, like furthering playing music with people. So I moved to California, spent the first few years just kind of playing around with friends and just kind of establishing myself as less of a, like a band member and more as like a, like hired guy. Uh, and then I started playing with an electronic pop artist named Big Block Delta. And then from that, that kind of transitioned to me playing with Census Fail. And then from that, that transitioned to me doing the Danny stuff. And then in between that, like, uh, like I played uh, like Coachella with Trash Talk. Um, I did some like studio work for the Black Queen, which is like Greg from Dillinger and yeah, yeah, Josh yeah. from Nine Inch Nails and did some stuff for them. And then just like these like little small things. But it's mainly been uh, BBD to Census Fail to now doing Danny. And um, yeah, it's been it's cool, man. It's super cool. Like uh like you said, we're out on tour with ELO. It's been super fun. Incredible band. They kick ass every night. Um, incredibly cool. Uh, the band, like playing in Danny's band, he's incredibly gracious and super awesome. And it's just like great vibes all the way around. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, like, no, nothing to complain about, you know? No, no, no. Yeah. And definitely I, ELO is like a throwback. So, um, you know, they've been around for quite some time. I, I, many people are, I'm sure, aware of like either their discography or at least a song of theirs so it's well kinda... you don't really you don't realize how many hits there are because like i was familiar with some stuff like mr blue sky and like mm -hmm. don't let me down and then you sit and like because it's all like it's an all adult seating <laughs> there's no general admission so you like actually have to sit down which is kind of awesome um and then they just like start playing songs and like oh that was a hit oh, i've heard that song before yeah. oh yeah and after a while you're like dude they just literally played like 20 fucking hits and you just don't and everybody's pumped. There's like old people just fucking wasted. Like mm -hmm. it's it's awesome. It's just such a great vibe, man. It's such a great vibe. They uh the actually the Rolling Stones are here tonight doing a makeup date for their concert, and uh, they, uh -huh. they postponed a couple weeks or months ago. And um, mm -hmm. I was asked to go. I, I can't make it tonight, unfortunately. But it was one of those things. Like I'm not a big Rolling Stones fan by any means. Like they're not like yeah. you know in my wheelhouse for the most part. But I knew that if I had gone. I'd sit through like 20 songs that I probably knew just like without knowing, you know what I mean? Just, yeah. It's, it's like an event. It's like, yeah, you might not be super into the stones, but you're going, you're going to be going to an arena or a stadium. Like it's going to be like what? 20 to 50,000 people yeah. singing along being like, it's, it's a good vibe, you know? Yeah. It's definitely, part. it's definitely, uh, you know, one, it's one of those bands where I think a lot of people definitely make the trek to go see. So unfortunately for me, I can't make it tonight. So yeah. Yeah. All right, well, um, let's go ahead and just kick it off with the, you know, yep. with, with the with the poison the well stuff, and uh, we'll touch base yep. hopefully on some other things later on. But uh, so obviously you've been asked it a million times. We talked about it right before mm -hmm. we got on here. Um, when can, if any time, can 
we expect like new music from Poison the Well? You want the short answer or do you want the long answer? I think I think, <laughs> I think the long answer would be uh, okay. It's probably but, yeah. yeah. Um, God, uh, I, the biggest thing right now with that is getting everybody on the same page because when the band finished off, we were basically on the same momentum that opposites started off of. Like there have been little breaks and obviously change in direction at times, but we were still like, even if it was like a minute amount, we were still kind of functioning off that momentum. And when the band stopped, everybody kind of went their separate ways. We all remained in contact and we're all, you know, we're all friends. Or it's, you know, it's like brothers. And it seems to me that like getting everybody back in the same room on the same page with like sort of a unified vision has been near impossible. And everybody else has other jobs. Like, you know, our singer Jeffy owns a company and like he's really focused on that. And I'm on tour and working with different people. And our, our guitar player, Ryan, is a, is a production manager and is like does done a, done a ton of production stuff and like with uh, touring bands in L.A. and like New York. So I feel like we're very much an all or nothing band. And because of that, it's it's been really difficult to just get everybody in the same room and like throw riffs around and everybody be like, this is awesome. And like build stuff. Like we've toyed around with it a little bit here and there, nothing that's been concrete and what's came out has been really interesting and cool, but to just get everybody to be like, yeah, this is cool. This is what we want to do. And we as a whole feel really good about it. It's just like impossible. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of like, I want to say the full long answer and not the short answer. It's like the medium answer, <laughs> but it's just like, it, it's just really getting everybody on the same page, you yeah. know? And it's like, you know, me, Jeff and Ryan obviously have kind of been in it since like the not early, early inception, but since, you know, people actually kind of started giving a shit about the band. Well, for the most part, and, Poison the Well in general. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's different eras, you know, there's like the Derek Miller era and then there's just like, there's the me, Jeff and Ryan kind of era with mm-hmm. obviously, you know, other people involved, but, and, you know, people have to say like in one era over the other, or they like all of it or whatever, you know, everybody has kind of a different particular uh, thing that they like, but that's really honestly what it is, is like getting everybody on the same page. It's just really, really difficult because life happens, right? You yeah. know, people get into relationships, uh, family members die. Like it just, it's, it seems like when we're kind of getting close to, you know, that actually kind of started happening. Uh, something mysteriously comes in the way. It's kind of like, up, yeah. Yeah. So I've, I'm not, I'm not saying it's out of the question in terms of poison while releasing any music. I don't know under what, I don't know how, mm-hmm. you know, just because it just seems impossible, but I never rule out and I just never rule it out. I mean, I'd love to because I particularly I have a an idea musically what I would want to do after like stepping away from the band for such a long time and playing with other people and just kind of opening up my musical horizons and becoming more of an, you know, just becoming more of an adult. Like yeah. Boys and Well ended when I was like 28, 29. I'm 38 now and, you know. I'm still continuing on the path and things are getting better and better. So I feel like I have something to offer to, I would have a little bit more to offer drumming wise and perspective wise and just overall creative wise. Not that I did before, but like imagine doing more something so, like, yeah, yeah. Like 10 years later and you continue to do something, you could look back and be like, you know, for me, like I like the last poison well record, the tropic rot, because the two prior records, I was very restrained. You know, it's like, don't do that. Just keep it very simple. Or like, don't do that fill there. There was a lot of like, whereas like that record. Interesting. Yeah, that that record, we did it at Steve Evans, who obviously has done a ton of bands. And he was like, no, do more. And I didn't really know what to do. We'd be tracking and like, but I wrote this part and this part specific in these past few records. Like everything was so tailored and so like that, like I, it was hard for me to kind of break loose where now it's, if I were to do something with Evans or whoever, and they'd be like, do more, it, I could easily bust it out and it yeah. would be less of like a, a barrier for me you know so that's cool yeah. um we'll it, see we'll see what happens yeah, ho- I'm, ho- I'm not really hopefully it does happen i know a lot of people out there uh definitely inquire about it especially when you know we, I, we try not to let out who we're gonna have on the podcast prior uh because yeah. you know just it is lamb goat but um <laughs> yeah it was one of the questions that was asked to me to ask you guys 
the most, you know, when's the new music and all this uh, coming out. So, yeah. But uh, one thing I know um, that surprised me when, you know, we kind of touched base the last couple of weeks, months, uh, trying to get this mm-hmm. situation rolling, um, that for the most part, none of you, I mean, you guys are based out of South Florida, but for the most part, you guys don't live in Florida anymore, right? You're in LA, like you were saying, and then uh, just yeah. in Chicago or, or Illinois or something like that. So, um, yeah, I live, I live in Long Beach. Uh, Ryan lives in, in LA proper. Cause he works the venues there. He's a production manager at a very prestigious venue in, uh, in Los Angeles. And then Jeffrey lives in Chicago and our bass player, Brad, who's been around for a while. He lives in like, like Palm beach, Florida, okay, but it's sure. not like my, it's not Miami, Fort Lauderdale, right. you know? And but he's the only one we, we really hear left in Florida. Yeah. But like kind of not really at yeah. the same time. <laughs> yeah. Cause he's like, it's not, he's, I think he's like hours away from Miami. So yeah. Well, but yeah, we just always just kind of use that as the base because that's where the band was established. But like, yeah, everybody's all over the place yeah. pretty much. Um, so I guess another one of the big questions is uh, you guys never really formally came out and said anything about like, hey, we're breaking up or hey, we're taking a break. You just kind of like took a break. Um, yeah. And it's kind of like the second one because like you guys did come back a couple years ago and play like a handful of dates. Um, I remember... Yeah. Yeah. I remember I caught you guys in Orlando, and I was like, holy crap, this could be like the last time I see you guys play, so I had to yeah. take it down there. Um, yeah, so why the long hiatus? Like, why why did you guys step away, you know, in the f- first time, and then when you guys got back together, I, I was surprised that you guys actually took another hiatus, because, you know, it just seemed like, oh man, everything is, like, the planets are aligning, you know, and it'll come you're te- back. You're, te- <laughs> you're, telling, you're telling me. All right, so I'll start with the original, why, original reason why we went on hiatus, right? So obviously the band had an upward trajectory up until about you come before you. Derek quits. We have to regroup. We have to figure things out. It takes us a really fucking long time to put out a record. And then we put out the record. It's the fucking weirdest thing ever that I'm like. You come people before that you? Tell, oh, no, no, no. Versions. Version, the one okay. after that. Okay. The one that ha- it's just it's just like a fucking it's just like we took everything from like blues to metal to hardcore. to And we just kind of put it in this thing and like. I guess this kind of works. Like this is really weird, but maybe people will like it. Maybe people won't. Yeah. But it was just a reflection of just all the chaos at the time. I mean, that's one thing like about Poison. Well, every record is a reflection of where the band was at. So that was that reason why that record was so all over the place was because Derek quit. We got released from Atlantic. We had to kind of figure out the next move. We changed management. Uh, Ryan's father died. We had to replace Derek, and Derek was a very, very big part of our band. So it was just utter chaos. So that's why that record was utter chaos. Okay, great. We kind of get everything. We kind of get everything back online. We tour on it. Uh, obviously, not as big. You, you know, with, with the first three records, we kept catching waves. Like, you know, you keep the wave. Next wave comes by, the band gets a little bit bigger, more mm-hmm. popular, mm-hmm. cooler shit happens. And between that, like, you you come before you coming out and versions. It was like four years. Yeah. So we missed all the waves. And then when we like get back on it, we put out this fucking virtually unlistenable record. <laughs> in most people in most people in most people's opinion, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Which I trust me, like I, I like I like it. It I think when I think about that record, it brings me back to a period of time. I like the record has a sonic identity. Like you put it on, you're like, oh, that's that fucking record. Yeah. Like whether you like it or not, you know, like I can appreciate its sort of where where we were we were collectively right yeah i, I mean i definitely so we, i definitely like that record i i must say like before we get into it i definitely do like that record so it was really weird it's fucking weird it, 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 it's, it's fucking well, it's fucking weird you know i'm i'm i know that you guys or at least part of your band is like big it, uh, deftone fans so like i always kind of just associated like well the deftones never really make the same record anyway their sound kind of evolves yeah. constantly <laughs> I figured like that was just kind of what you guys were wanting to do as well. So it's weird hearing the back end stories, obviously on it, uh, yeah. on it. But well, yeah, everybody's into really different shit. Like Jeffrey's a big Deftones fan. I like some songs. I'd say I'm more of like a you know on the surface fan. I like a lot of like weird dark electronic music, and mm-hmm. I like a lot of like classic rock, and I like you know like the '90s stuff, like all the stuff that happened in Seattle. And Ryan's a big progressive jazz blues guy. So it's like you kind of put all that shit together and you, you can kind of hear a little bit of the, I don't know, the sonic DNA of like kind of what versions was. Mm-hmm. Um, so just kind of continuing on to like the hiatus stuff. Um, so we started touring on that record and, you know, we did like 
as we were doing, we had to split it up into two sessions because it was such a long period of time. So we did an initial session of like, I don't know, probably about seven or eight songs that made it to the record and did other tours. Like we toured with Dillinger in Europe. We did, I think, the 2005 or 2006 Sounds of the Underground, which was like kind of like a ferret yeah, thing. Like the Ozfest, um, like an Ozfest, but for hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And we did like a few other little tours to kind of keep the momentum. So it wasn't completely going away, but people were doing this asking like, hey, you guys just put out a bunch of records and a lot of people care. Where's this? Where's the other thing? And trying to figure it out and had to do the deal with Ferret. Finished off the session. I think it was like uh, December of 2007. Cool. Awesome. We have the record. We send it to Ferret. They're like, sure, we'll put it out. <laughs> Thinking just on the name. Alone, I'm sure when Carl heard that shit, he's like, what is this? This is not <laughs> this is not anything. Yeah, not what I'm used like to. Anything before. <laughs> not what I'm used to. But he's like, all right, well, people care about Poison. Well, you know, hopefully, you know, this will make sense and people pick it up, pick up on it. And then we kind of started touring after that. And, you know, like you can kind of see the it's just it's just started doing this. It was like the, the nosedive started happening. Yeah. So we're touring on it. We did some good tours. Creatively, we kind of regrouped and figured out where we wanted to go. Uh, wrote and recorded the Tropic Rot, which we all felt really good about. Did it with Steve, which was awesome. And then the touring after that was like if the if touring for versions was like this. The touring for Tropic Rot was like this. It just started doing a fucking nosedive. Like attendance-wise um, or just like overall reception? Everything. Like attendance-wise. Because we're oversaturated. Like if you knew that we were coming to Florida like five times in a year, why would you give a shit? Yeah. Because that's what we did. That's what we were banned. We put out records and kids came to the shows and that's how we kind of survived. And we put gas in the, you know, the van's tank and, you know, bought supplies. And you know, like that's, that's just kind of what we did. And – it was just the guarantees were becoming less and less. It wasn't sustainable. We were starting to kind of get into a little bit of debt because it's like you have people working on the back end that like, hey, well, you know, we collect this commission. We do this. And it's just like we weren't getting the right tours, too, because we felt like we felt like Tropic Rot was like the best sort of, I don't know, version of our band. It sounded the best. Everybody's playing was really great. The songs were really interesting, so on and so forth. And it just wasn't working. So fast forward to the towards the end of that cycle. Ironically enough, I'm in Detroit. We get wrapped in Detroit. Mm. <laughs> uh, like literally, like we, you know, we check into the we started a tour at Billy Talent. We played St. Andrews Hall, drove out of town to the airport, parked the van, got hotel rooms. I remember that night I went and fucking jogged on the treadmill for I don't even remember why. Went to bed. A few of the guys went out to a bar to eat or drink, took the van, came back, woke up in the morning, walked out the front, hey. Where'd you guys park the van? I don't know. It must be around back. All of us fucking with our luggage and shit, like walking <laughs> around this hotel. It's like, the van is nowhere. The yeah. van is fucking gone. Like, completely gone. And we just start a tour. We're stuck in Detroit. It's like, what do, what do we do? So obviously we piecemeal some gear, gear together. We, our management figures out to kind of get money. You know, we, I think we put up like a shirt with all like the manifest of all the shit stolen. Mm. And, you know, people donated and that, that money basically went into finishing that tour. The tour, yeah. Yeah. Um, fortunately, our gear was insured. The vehicle was insured. We were able to sort of get money back to be able to buy stuff and pay debts and do all that stuff. But that was, that was really the beginning of the end. That was just like the, the, the punch in the stomach. Yeah. Um, cause after that, we finished the tour. We went home. We flew to Japan, to Tokyo to Japan to do Loud Park. Uh, fucking disaster. Like, imagine playing an arena <laughs> in Japan and you're playing all these killer fucking, you know, all these killer bands. Like, I think Apri was playing and like Slayer and fuck all these bands. Imagine playing an arena and like there's 200 people like in the front row mm -hmm. <laughs> and then everything else is just like empty. And it was just, it was just like, okay, like another morale hit. And then yeah. flew there. We, we flew to uh, Australia to do like a headlining Australia tour. And it was okay, you know, two to 500 kids, whatever. But it's like every other person was saying, like, you know, mate, if you would have came here six years ago, there would have been a thousand people. Yeah. There would have been 800 people. And it's just kind of like, oh my God. So from there, we go from, we do all Australia, we go to New Zealand, we fly from New Zealand to uh, Italy. We have some headline shows booked. They were fun. They were super cool. We did them with a promoter that we had a relationship with. That's an awesome guy at Hellfire. He's always been really great to us. And all the shows were awesome. We were, supposed to join up with Thursday and Rise Against to tour Europe. Rise Against asked us to come out, us opening Thursday and then them. And obviously Rise Against is massive and they're mm -hmm. very, very big in Europe. And 
we started the tour thinking that, okay, this is going to be pretty good. You know, I don't know how it would be received, but like for the most part, this will, this will be cool. Sharing a bus for Thursday. It was around the time that they were also on the fucking decline as yeah. well. A few years before they were like, okay, they hung it up. They took a break. Obviously they're back now. Things are good. And, um, yeah, nobody fucking cared. <laughs> That's the way to put it. Nobody fucking cared. I literally, we'd go on stage every night. We'd fucking play. And imagine 8,000 people staring at you like you have fucking 20 heads. Right, right, right. Or like, or like, yeah, we went over like a fucking fart in church. I mean, there's really no way around it. I remember one night I was playing, we were playing in Germany and there was about fucking thousands of people out there. I remember playing and I remember a fucking beer just whizzing by my head, like narrowly missing me. And I was like, oh man, this is just brutal. At one point, me and Jeff were, we were just on the bus after. We were probably a few weeks into the tour. I'm like, yeah, we can't do this anymore, dude. Like, nobody cares. Morale is at an all time low. We have insurance money to be able to sort of, you know, pay our debts, buy gear. It's like, why, why beat this dead horse? It had the, the overall, I guess, thing why we went on hiatus, I guess, is not because we didn't like making music with one another. We did. We all enjoyed. Of being creative, it was just nobody really fucking cared because we had just oversaturated and we'd done the wrong tours and we put out, even though I'm proud of those past two records because I think that they're musically pretty interesting, it just wasn't the right time for them. Yeah. I don't even know if, it, I don't need, I mean, I, honestly, I don't pay attention to that stuff. I just kind of look at those records and I'm like, okay, versions, really weird rec- record we made in Sweden that kind of sounds weird and it's just a bunch of weird shit going on. You know, Tropic Rod, okay, I could cut loose a little bit more and the production's bigger and cleaner. And like, I feel like that was like a really killer record to end off. But like, I have no idea if anybody cares. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I don't pay attention to that stuff. Right, it's right. like, it means something to me. And if people appreciate it, that's super cool. And everybody in the band's super appreciative. But like, so yeah, it, it was just kind of like we needed to kind of, we needed to stop. Morale was low. People didn't care about those records. People, like the, the tours weren't getting any bigger. We were making less and less money. We couldn't even really survive. So we're just like, let's do an indefinite hiatus and just see where the chips land. Like yeah. we kind of need to take a step from this band. And who are we as people out of our identity of being the guys in Poison the Well? Like we had to kind of rediscover who we were right. and like create identities and elsewhere, you know, like, like I said, Ryan became a production manager and, you know, like I became like a, dry, a drummer for hire and, and Jeff, Jeff had a vision for a company that he wanted to start. And like, we just kind of discover ourselves. Yeah. So that was like, that was like the first phase. And then I think it was around 2015, um, offers started coming in and they were good offers. Like, okay, we could do this. And like, we're adults. Like you have to make money. Like it'd be killer oh, yeah, to get it's in not the financially, van. uh, sound. I, there's no, I mean, especially as an adult, you can't really just put life on hold and just appease everyone well we did that to the fullest extent at least i did from 18 to like 29 i really milked the fact that like i could come home making nothing and reinvest into like our band or come home with very minimal money or if we get an advance of some sort we invest it back i could do that but like at the time when we got the off it was for a uh, skate and surf mm-hmm. for um jersey I, at that point it's like i was living with a girlfriend and like, we had an apartment and i had bills and it's like real kind of offers kept sort of coming in because I guess the band going away and there was a void for what we were doing sonically, like, you know, poison well is poison well for better or for worse, whether you hate the band, you like the band. It was what it was. And there's a lot of people that like it. There's a lot of people that don't like it, but for the people that liked it, there was just this void. Mm -hmm. And so offers, good offers started coming in and we had a conference call and I'm not going to say who the person was, but there was a reluctancy to do it. But he signed on regardless to do it. So we played those two shows and let's just say it was a little bit chaotic, you know, like uh, it, was, it was a little bit chaotic at best without going into details and calling anybody out because I don't want to do that at all because, right. you know, whatever. So we do that and then uh, circle around again. We get a really good offer for uh, Rock Fest in like Montebello, Quebec. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, and then, when is that? That's like 2000. 14, 15, 16, 16, okay. no, no, 16. So this, uh, we played a, the first show we ever played back as like, you know, as the sort of, I guess you'd say reunion shows was mm-hmm. in, uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, uh, music hall in Williamsburg and then skate and surf. And then that was it. And then we didn't do anything for probably about a year, year and a half and offers started coming in. It was a like, good offer. So it's like, well, why not? You know, like, why not, why not play shows? Like 
I, we want to do it. Like we want to have fun. Like I miss doing this. Like I love making music with those dudes. Like when we come together and we do something, it's interesting, you know, yeah. for better or for worse. So I was like, why not do that? Like, why not, you know, get back on board and play some shows. And we did it. And once again, it was kind of chaotic. And at the end of that, I was going through like a, some very dark personal stuff. And I just kind of had to step away because uh, the ending of a relationship was just a lot for me to deal with. And the way those shows kind of ended, um, as, as ambiguous as I can be, with the way the shows ended and a bit of tension in the band because of people's like conduct and behavior, I just wanted to step back. I was like, I can't do this. We, let's pay our pay the credit card, do all the things we got to do. And let's put this on hold again, because it was, it was just, it seemed like when play shows on paper, they were great. Oh, cool. Play glass house. So play here and play that and play all these cool venues and people show up like, well, yeah, it's no brainer. Why wouldn't you do it? But internally there was just a lot of, there was just a lot of chaos hmm. and, and, you know, people, including me going through a lot of personal stuff that you start going through when you're in your thirties and relationships end, and, you know, family member this and uh, this, that, and, you know, like all this bullshit. So that was kind of why we stepped away a second time was that it was just really chaotic. Um, and I had to get my sort of, let's just say mental health and emotional health back on track right, to where right. I was prior. Um, I, I speak for nobody else. This is just right, me right, and like right. my, my, pers my perspective. So, um, yeah. And then that, I th that we, those shows were 2016 kind of have distance from one another. You know, I talked to Ryan infrequently and talked to Jeff I mean, even talked to Derek infrequently and, you know, we, me, Jeff and Ryan sort of spoke a little bit about music, but like I said, it comes back to we're getting everybody on the same page with a unified musical vision, feeling good about that musical vision to like feel good enough to commit to like, these are songs, this is an EP and, or this is a full length, or this is even just like a seven inch or seven inch split or whatever enough to say, Hey, like, okay, we haven't released anything in 10 years. Like here's new poison. Oh, well, like love it or hate it, whatever, you know, the sort of attitude that we've kind of always had, uh, as being a band, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, we just can't get on the page for that. So, but yeah, though, that's kind of the start and stops and, and why those things kind of, kind of went down and went half, uh, and happened. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I know like a, you know, a lot of your records, at this particular point are coming up on like big anniversary, you know, like 10 year anniversary, 15 year anniversary, you know, and I think like a lot of the, uh, I think the fan, like the fan base would kind of appreciate like, uh, you know, like bands do those tours where they do like a yeah. tear from the red tour, you come before you tour, you know, whatever. Totally. And, um, I think that's something that is missing obviously from you guys, but that and knowing now everything that makes some sense, um, which is also, can't get, it just can't like that. And that's, and that's the thing. It's just like, I think those are great ideas. I would love to do, I mean, opposite of December this year in, in December is turning 20. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it'd be, it'd, it'd be cool to play some shows and maybe get Derek involved, maybe this, maybe that. And, but I just, everybody, like I said, it just getting everybody back on the same page is virtually it. It's virtually impossible. And yeah. like I said, I'm not going to point fingers at anybody because it's a little bit of, Everyone. it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of everybody. Yeah, it's a little bit of everybody. So it's like, yeah, it would be cool to do that. I mean, Tropic Rock turned 10, uh, I think, this month. That is crazy. Like 10 it's years. Just, that's crazy yeah. to think about. <laughs> yeah. To think about and that. it's like, yeah, it'd be cool to have done something like, you know, maybe like a, a Tropic Rock beer or like, because obviously, you know, people do like, you know, bands do collaborations oh, yeah. with beer yeah, companies yeah. and like, but it's just nothing because it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that kind of like, takes care of the social media. I'm the guy that kind of like pays the bills, even though there's not a lot, but you know what I mean? Like I kind of manage that stuff. So it's like an email will go out and you know, some people will be into stuff. Some people won't. And then it just will never get signed off on. So I'm like, okay, whatever. I'm just going to go. Cool. I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing, you know, playing with this band, playing with this artist, pursuing this. Cause it's like, there's like, seems to be sort of like a, not a huge interest in it, which doesn't make sense to me. Cause it's like, why not? We worked really hard. Like if some company wants to like, say in theory wants to do like a 20th anniversary beer for opposite. That's fucking cool. Yeah. Like, that's cool. That's cool. That's like, that's the, like me be an old man, 60 years old and have like a case of poison oil beer. Like that's just cool to look at. Like yeah, not many and, people get to do that and just look at it and be appreciative of it. And it's like, 
It's like, why can't I get anybody else to fucking sign on? Like, I just don't understand. Yeah, it's, it's a little strange that, you know, because, I, I, again, I, I would feel like the other members of the band, and I don't want to speak for them or you to speak for them or anything, but I would feel yeah. like they would also enjoy, you know, some kind of, like, a nostalgia type thing. And I, I understand where totally. you, you were saying, um, you know, it took you a while to put out other records once you stopped riding that wave. And, you know, what's weird is when you were talking about that, I was thinking in my head, like, at the time frame, um, that was like a pretty influential time for like the the hardcore metal scene too. Uh, you know, yeah. it was um, and you guys were a part of it the entire way going up. And then I think you kind of like you said now that you were saying that it took you a while. I was like, yeah, because to me as a as a Poison Wolf fan, you were always in the mix. You know what I'm saying? But if you're not like a fan yeah. per se, if you're you know what I mean, like your brand kind of fades after a couple of years and then next thing totally you, know, you put another thing out and it's not as well accepted or uh, yeah, as well. But that's always, Go ahead. what were you going to say? Sorry. As well as it's not like, you know, taken as, as well as the other ones had been. Well, I feel like with us, with the exception of like opposite every record after that, it was always met with like some side eye or like, what is this? So we just kind of got used to it. Cause it's like, you know, you have certain bands, won't name names, but they have their, their blueprint. And they're like, this blueprint works. People show up. We sell a ton of shit. Whereas for better or for worse, we were always like, how can we make the coolest creative thing possible without thinking about money? Yeah. Like, yeah, we signed to Atlantic. We got a bunch of money. But we also put out a really fucking weird record on Atlantic that doesn't sound like some sort of polished thing. So it, that was always the goal was just like, let's make the coolest thing. Like we have a platform, people care, like let's put out the most creative, most interesting thing and just people could like it mm-hmm. and, and we're not. And regardless, it's just like, we're going to do what we're going to do. We're going to do what we're going to do. And if you don't like it, you could fuck off. Yeah. Just very sort of like, you know, I guess punk rock about it. And I mean, that was the way it was all the way up until the end. Um, we just did what we wanted to do. And like, I think in some ways it hindered us maybe financially or long-term career wise, which is somewhat short-sighted, but I do think in terms of like a creative legacy, uh, you know, I'm extremely proud. Like if there's one thing I could like look back and look at what Poison Well did, you know, we have a really, you know, how do I say it? How do I say it? Like, uh, we have like a well-respected consistent catalog and we were part of a particular, popularizing a particular uh genre of music you know and that like that to me is like the most fucking humbling thing yeah well, i mean like, you guys were money money is part of that too like i, I know you're like money, downplaying it a little bit but you are you were a very influential big part of that whole genre i would just say it took well i mean it it's really weird because when the band broke up we were kind of at an all-time low in terms of morale we didn't think anybody gave a fuck so we walked away and then we just like you know, play with a band and then go, like, oh, you're in Poison Law. And they'd be like fucking freaked out. I'm just like, yeah. like, you know, not real. Like it took me a while to realize like the sort of impact that the band had because we just didn't really think that way. Like mm-hmm. there's not people, I'm, I'm going to say this and I'm sure you're going to get the reference. We're not toting around as if we invented a fucking genre of music. We were just like, we want to do cool shit. And uh, again, do you I, have my list of questions or something or what? Uh, we, we can get to that too, but I will say though, because me and some of the other members spoke about this and we just kind of laughed and we're like, we're, we're kind of aware of where we were in the mix. And like, you know, we have a joke thread going on or whatever talking was like, all we were doing is ripping off Kaven. Yeah. Like we open, we'll openly talk about it. Like, yeah, we're just a bunch of kids and we like deaf tones. We like Kaven. We like this and that. And like, we just kind of took it and spun it. But like, we just think of it as purely like, as like, I don't know. It's just really bold. Yeah. Like we don't, we like, I know we had more to do with it and we take less, we take it less serious in terms of like having to like flex the muscle and more just kind of like, it was really cool and humbled to be, we're humbled to have been part of it. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's less of flexing and more like, that's cool, man. We're just yeah. a bunch of stupid kids. Well, you, you also fucking time, Miami. Yeah. At the time, you probably <laughs> didn't even know what your situation was and how it would play out. You're just doing you, you know what I mean? But bro, we had, no idea. When we wrote when we wrote Opposite of December, literally in the studio, the fucking week that we took to record it, we were like, it'd be really cool if kids showed up to the show and sung along. Yeah. That was the only goal. Like, let's make a killer record, you know, like Derek was heavily into like older converge and like like 
cave in beyond hypothermia and until your heart stops and like acme and like all these bands like early coalesce and botch mm-hmm. and he's just like oh dude, it'd be so cool if we could play with these bands and the kids would show up and like you know they they, they people would care about what we're doing mm-hmm. and then suddenly we put the record out and it's just this fucking whatever it was I'm, I'm on i'm on the inside so like all i just know is we were playing shows and people like started caring it wasn't until hellfest that i was like okay there's something going on here like i don't know what but like I just graduated high school. I'm like, I'm just going to follow this because this just seems like the right path. Right, right. Um, so obviously, I mean, it seems pretty apparent. My next question was, do you miss, you know, Poison Well? And it kind of seems like you do. So um, I don't know. Maybe well, we'll, we'll, we'll have to start a change.org cl- uh, petition or something like that to get you guys back on. <laughs> let, let me clarify that. I appreciate the past to Poison Well and I appreciate what it was. Like I was saying, I'm humbled. I feel I'm very proud about our catalog and like what we did in that genre. But I'm more excited about where Poison Well could go. Yeah. Because that's the, that's the thing that, like, for me, is like, oh, man, like, it'd be really cool. Like, I could hear it in my head. Like, I can, I could hear what I would do drumming-wise, and I could hear what Ryan would write and what Jeff would do and this type of songs and, like, where we're at. And I think it'd be really something cool. Now, whether people would like it now or they'd like it 10 years later or they wouldn't like it at all, who the fuck knows? It's not – it's my it, – I feel like it's just my responsibility to make cool music with people that I keep – I care deeply about – put it out and wherever it sticks is where it sticks yeah i think we're I, you know what i mean i now that it's 10 years past tropic rot i think we're due for another you know <clears> just <throat> a, a glimpse into what's going on in the ptw camp you know um, <laughs> yeah man. i'd love to man i would i would <coughs> oh, fuck, water going down the the trachea <coughs> yeah wrong uh wrong pipe water gang huh? sorry what were you saying nothing this is about that time you know i feel um I feel a lot of bands, you know, and then and again, some of it has to do probably with your fan base too, becoming the same age as you and also dealing mm-hmm. with the same situations you guys are dealing with, whether it be yeah. like getting families, having kids, doing, you know, whatever, whatever, being more responsible in your 20s and 30s and stuff like that. But keyword being trying, trying, trying to be responsible. <laughs> trying. Uh, but I also think that it's aged. Long. I mean, t- no, enough time has gone by to where like if you did if the people did have kids or if they did have situations they're better at handling like their time and, and everything so i think yeah. who knows i think right now or not right now but you know in the next year or two 2020 who's coming up you never know you guys mm-hmm. just put a little something something out you know maybe if this is a three song ep or we'll you know, see we'll, we'll, cool. we'll see man it, it, it's like i said it's all dependent upon if we can collectively get together and figure out where to go and what it should sound like because that's the biggest that's that's the biggest thing and if we could figure that out i think whatever we put out would be really interesting yeah like i said whether people like it or not who the fuck knows but i know that whatever we release we would feel very very good about and you know uh we we yeah we put it out there and it would just like dudes would just be like whatever people could either like it or not well i do think uh you know metalcore if you want to call it that is uh definitely in need of um some yeah. great great music <laughs> uh there are great bands like you know uh vain and knock loose and some other newer type bands that are coming out yeah, that yeah. Are just killing it but there has been a long drought i feel you know what i mean in that yeah. particular genre um all right well you know well let's throw it back we're talking about opposites of, opposite of december uh we'll talk well mm-hmm. let's go back to the beginning of the band um what was the what was the reason uh, for you guys, because I've been, you were originally for more or less a jealousy issue, and then uh, you guys kind of like split, right? Or no, nah, no. Nah, I'll, I'll, so I'll give you more of the history of that. Go for it. So history goes: uh, original singer Ari and Ryan wanted to start like a melodic hardcore band. Um, they got a few other guys that were local in like kind of the punk and hardcore scene, and I was playing in a band with Ryan, like a punk band called Last Minute. You know, just kind of like old AFI ish, like kind of like you know Ignite that kind of vibe. Okay. And he asked me to play. So we started kind of working on material, whatever. My style at the time was a little bit more faster punk stuff. And obviously, you know, what that first Poison Well EP was, was, you know, it, 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 stylistically, I just kind of wasn't there, right? <clears throat> so the original name for the band was called Doubting Thomas. And apparently, I think there's like a ministry side project of that or they're Skinny Puppy or there's some, it, the mm-hmm. name was already taken in some way. So then it got changed to an acre loss, uh, an acre lost. And as that transition happened, 
everybody in the band was like, yeah, you know, I don't think Chris's playing works very well. It's just not where it's at, where it should be. They got another guy to come in. They recorded uh, that first 12 inch an acre lost um, promise. So tomorrow split I think it came out in like 96 or seven, something like that. And I was out of the band. I was out of the band for like two or three months. And I guess they were having issues with the guy playing drums with them. I my playing whatever over that period of time caught up and they hit me up. I'm like, Hey, we kind of want to, this is kind of what we want to do. We want to change the name of the band to poison the well, you know, we're going to kick this dude out. We're going to bring you back. And then, um, good life records out of Belgium is interested in putting an EP out. And I was like, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Like I was like 16, 17 year old, uh, old kid at the time. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, of course. Like some Belgian label, like, cool. Like I'm 100% on board. So that kind of happened. And that was like the beginning stages of Poison the Well. And that was um, when you were saying a jealousy, a jealousy issue. At the time, the band had two singers. We had the scream guy and then we had the sing guy that kind of screamed too. Mm-hmm. Um, the one uh, one singer, Dwayne Hussein, uh, eventually we kicked him out. It just wasn't working. He went off and started a jealousy issue. And that was kind of his offshoot uh of poison well but it was never like i would me or ryan or anybody else aside from him nobody else was involved with that Mm -hmm. okay do you uh do you guys regret not keeping two vocalists (laughs) no it's the best thing ever getting rid of them like well this is the thing it's like so jeff played in a a miami hardcore band called defy and our original singer ari at the time we still wanted to continue with the two singer thing and ari was like Yo, this dude, his his exact voice, his exact quote was voice of gold. Mm-hmm. Like, yo, yo, dog, this guy has a voice of gold. Like, we gotta get this guy, we gotta see this band. So I remember going seeing Defy and being like, yo, this dude has like original Zeo singer, like scream. Like you could hold his screams out for like fucking a minute. And his, you know, before and basically before he hit puberty, he kind of had that mm-hmm. that that, you know, that, you know, the opposite screaming, I guess. So we're like, yo, this is fucking awesome. Let's get this guy in. And then we got him in doing the two singer thing. It was so fucking apparent that Jeff's voice was so much better than Ari's. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, it was just so like, it was just like, he would just sing. And I, I think over time, uh, Ari was like uh, divvying out vocals. And I think over time, he just started giving Jeff like less and less. Yeah. And I forget what happened at some point, like Ari, we kicked him out because there was some sort of dumb shit that happens in your 20s or your teens in your 20s. Yeah. And, you know, we got Derek to come in and then we got him old bass player Alan to come in and like that was like the the original sort of lineup was like core you know unit. Jeff the core the core unit but musically it was me Jeff Ryan and Derek like Alan really didn't do much he was more of the the business guy because he had a relationship with uh, John Wally from G Records and he was kind of the guy that was like a you know wheeling and dealing so to speak mm-hmm. and he could you know me and I me and Alan are totally cool haven't seen him in forever but yeah, I'm sure he knows he can barely play bass. <laughs> <laughs> no heart, no, 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 no bad feelings, no ill will. No, 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 no. Like I think last time I saw him, I was like I saw him at like the Warped Tour, and it's like, oh hey dude, how you doing? It's just like cool, man. It's like totally cool, like no issues, you know. That's cool. Um, we just had Torch on, which is obviously another South Florida band, and they, uh, yeah. you guys, you guys got brought up, and they said a lot of bands from Broward say that they're from Miami, uh, but they're not technically from Miami. How do you feel about that? I feel like Miami is a very big city. And when you say Fort Lauderdale, people are like, where? Yeah. And our singer, Jeffrey, was from Miami. Um, as I lived in Miami for a little bit, and our, our guitar player, Ryan, uh, lived in Miami for a little bit. But I have always, for me personally, I've always said, you know, Poison Well is a Miami Fort Lauderdale band. Mm-hmm. That's how I've always sort of presented it. But it's just easier because it's like when you think of big cities in the U.S., you think of Los Angeles, Seattle, Chicago, Miami, New York City. It's like people can like relate, figure out where it is very quickly. Where's Fort Lauderdale? Some people know, and some people are like, is that like is that on the west coast of Florida? Is that Texas, is that close to Fort something? Myers? Yeah, yeah. Or they feel like is that close to Tampa? Yeah. So it's just it, it, it was more just a more convenience to explain to people like where the band is from. But yeah, the, our singer Jeffrey was originally born in Hialeah, which is a suburb of Miami. So technically, you know, so, you can kind of like group it all in. Um, I just group like I just group it all because also too Derek. And our bass player, Brad, uh, they're from West Palm Beach. Mm-hmm. So, like, in some cases, I say Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Sometimes I say South Florida because it's like you have, you know, me and Ryan are from Broward. Jeffrey's from Miami. And then Derek and Brad were from West Palm. So, it's like literally all three counties that make up collectively South Florida. Yeah. 
Well, so. I mean, I, I'm from North Florida, so all when when you say like West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, uh, you know, Miami and South Beach and all that other shit, that's kind of all in the same freaking place to me until I made yeah. it down there, and then I found out, you know, you you drive it and you're just like, oh, everything's like an hour away almost, so yeah, <laughs> from each other. But pretty, it's good to group pretty, it like that. It's just easier for explaining to people, and like when you're doing press releases and shit like that, it was just easier just to say that. So it's just like. I don't. I'm not. I don't really care if, if, <laughs> if, if, if Torch if Torch has any issues with us saying we're from like from. No, Miami. I don't think they had any issues, but they 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 did make they did say that on the last podcast, so I figured I'd bring it up. Um, so um, you guys are classified as a couple different genres. We kind of you know touched base on it a little bit. Uh, what would you say you guys kind of are? Hard, um, uh, metalcore, post hardcore? Because uh, I mean, you guys, again, your sounds change throughout each record yeah. so it's kind of hard to fathom but would you say like let's say the first record would that be like a metalcore record uh i guess you would classify it as that like our first ep distance and then opposite i would i guess as sort of you know the standards of what metalcore are i would i would classify that as metalcore mm -hmm. um i'd say tear from the red and you come before you are more like post I'd say like post hardcore. Mm -hmm. I'd say versions is. I mean, this is kind of a you know overused term, but experimental. Mm -hmm. Even though I I think that term is like so like, you know, fucking passe. Yeah. But I mean, it, it, I mean, to to a certain degree, it kind of is because yeah. it's like, where do you have blues and like hardcore in the same genre? Like, like I said, for better or for worse, whether you think it's a fucking dumpster fire or you think it's great, like it is experimental in its own sort of unique yeah. uh, weird way. And then I would classify Tropic Rot as more uh, like post hardcore, but okay. like when we would sit down and talk as like guys in a band, we would just classify everything as the broad heavy, like heavy is not necessarily like gainy guitars and like double kick and crash cymbals. Heavy could be like, you know, a low gain guitar with like really intense vocals with a really intense, you know, vocal or um, guitar melody going over. I mean, I, I guess I would use, even though this band is, I guess, uh, considered like, was it like post rock, the Cult of Luna? Yeah, yeah. Like they're heavy as fuck, but if you listen to their guitars, Not it's so all much. super low. Yeah. It's so it's super low gain. So we like back to kind of what I was saying is like we just always interpret things as like what's heavy, like what's going to have the most like heavy impact. It's not crunchy guitars. It's not clicky kicks. It's not. I mean, opposite. I guess you could make that argument that that's what it was. But when we kind of started maturing and figuring out what we like i mean i mean the beatles i want you she's so heavy i mean you can make the argument that the end of that song that goes on for probably about four or five minutes is the invention of like like doom metal mm, mm -hmm, yeah. i don't know if you ever heard it but if you listen to it you're like oh i could see where like i could see where like black sabbath like Influenced thought that was a that, cool yeah yeah so like we would listen to that and be like dude that's so fucking that you know aside from the song title she's so heavy like, that's fucking heavy shit that shit just went on forever and it's such a cool progression imagine if like we transpose that and play that in c or something similar to that and the drums were a little slower like so it's always just been like making stuff heavy and or melodic or a combination of the two or just doing weird shit but yeah overall umbrella of heavy yeah so i mean and, and opposite of december came out what 98 99 or 97 98 90 it came out uh, it was brought to my attention that it came out December 7th, I believe, or December 14th, somewhere early to mid December of 99. So we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of yeah. it as of this December. And that's definitely before, um, the curse, I guess we'd call it, uh, which is Atreyu's, you know, big breakout <laughs> album. So safe to say you kind of beat them to the punch a little bit, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I knew it was going to, I knew it was going to, I knew it was going to come up cause I'm sure you asked a lot of bands maybe around that era, like. So what do you think about that comment? Well, you know, it, we, we it, Lamgo has been focusing a lot on metalcore in the last couple of years, but yeah, it's always funny when when that band uh, definitely says it. And you know, I recently saw them, and it's just it's kind of like their newer stuff is the furthest removed from metalcore I could possibly say. It's more yeah. like rock, which is cool to you know that they're doing that, but it's more like you know hard rock or heavy rock or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's, it's more. Uh, like is what it is, you know? Um, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess it is what it is. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be, I, I don't, I've met a few dudes in the in that band throughout the years and they've always been very nice and very like polite people. I couldn't tell you what their music sounds like. I, it just never really, and that's not, that's not sort of a, 
that's not uh, like any sort of like negative right. negativity towards them. I just, it just never, I just never really like, I just never really listened to them. You yeah, know what I mean? Sure. Um, there definitely, when that, was, there definitely was a time where like when the curse came out and I think maybe the following album after that, that they, you know, I, I really, I jammed the curse a lot. I thought that was cool when it mm-hmm. came out too, you know? So it's not yeah. like I'm saying it's a bad record or they didn't have a part in metal chorus. Yeah. I don't know if they started, uh, it, you know? I mean, you know, like I said, like kind of we talked about earlier, it's like there was, I mean, there was Converge. Yeah. There was Botch. There was Coalesce. There was Caven. There was how many other fucking bands doing really inventive, cool, heavy music before, you know, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. the, the uncooler younger brothers at the time came in <laughs> yeah. and kind of like packaged it in such a way to like, yeah, it's like, dude, like in terms of that, if they think they invent, invented metalcore, that's fucking cool. I mean, they may have invented I, like I, a pop version of it. You know what I mean? Like the more, yeah, you can make an version. argument. I'm sh- I'm sure you can make an argument. I mean, to be perfectly honest, like, I'm not even upset about that just because of all the comments on, like, Lamb Goat and all the comments on PRP of people just, like, the funniness that came from that. Yeah. Like, it was almost worth it. Like, I'm not even mad. Like, yo, you think you invented Metalcore? That's totally cool. You had something to do with it. I'm not going to deny you that at all in any way, shape, or form. But, like, just the sheer fucking comedic comments that came from that. It was totally fucking worth it. Yeah, worth it. Like, without, with, without question, without question. I even had people fucking texting me like, dude, did you fuck? Like, I'm just like fucking at home jerking off or like <laughs> yeah. doing whatever. You know, I just get these fucking text messages and it was like, my, my response is always like, uh, or like what I think. I was like, Poison Wall always just ripped off until like, um, cave ins until your heart stops. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that yeah. was just always the thing. It was just like, or like early convergence, just like, we just, just, yeah, we just, or like Zay, like, you know, um, not early Zeo, but like rebranding of Zeo, you mm-hmm. know, with like uh, Cobra Commander voice. Yeah. Even though those dudes are super cool, <laughs> I just didn't know how to. Ex- I don't just don't know how to say it in any other way. Like those right, dudes are right. super. Like they have like yeah, we're like inter- we're internet cool with one another, and like they're sweet guys. But you know what I mean? Like we yeah, just yeah, like, yeah sure. we just took the shit that we liked and like we made just like own, made the know? right. Yeah, well, no, I, I didn't say we made it our own. We just packages the right shit at the right time and people are like that's cool it was just kind of like right place right time right sound well and again you know yeah. myspace and all that other stuff was you know coming out around not for opposite for the most part but you know social media was coming out around tear for the red you become you come for you in that area and that you know that for the genre i think was super huge i i, I really think um myspace was something that a lot of people probably it helps. yeah in a depth they probably they probably missed the music part of MySpace because that's something that like Facebook never integrated, you know, in, in the yeah, social media. Like successfully. Yeah. So it, that's one thing I do miss about uh, MySpace was the music part of it, especially like the searching of bands. Like you could search bands in States in certain genres, you know, like if a band had like hardcore in there, you know, you had like what yeah. three descriptions that you could, you put, you could put a hardcore in like a city and you could search those bands. You could put a state and search those bands. I think that's yeah. something that is lost in the new social media, but it is what it is. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, to back to what you're saying in terms of like when social media came out, I specifically remember being in Sweden, finishing up like vocals, mixing and mastering overdubs for you come before you. And like, I got like an invite or two to like Friendster. And I was like, what is this? Like, we yeah. friends are, and we're bored out of our fucking mind because we're like in a little small town in like northern Sweden. So it's just like, oh, like, oh, I know that guy, or like, I know that girl. And you, it was like the infant stages of that. And then from there, it, it kind of, it seemed like Friendster died really quick. Yeah. The and then MySpace, like, MySpace, and then MySpace just ran with that fucking, that torch for God knows how long, you know? A couple of years. And then, you know, Tom got the F out and cashed his yeah. check and he was gone doing photos or something now um so anyway. <laughs> just richest richest rich shit does not give it a fuck he got out in the right time i'll tell you that uh, um yeah going back to the metal core situation uh so loud bar they rank your uh they rank opposite of december as like the second overall best hardcore album uh, you know of all time or whatnot um yeah. does that surprise you because i mean you're behind converge uh, in that but you also that album is in front of a lot of other albums, like you said, Botch, Cave In, it's above them. It's above like even like some of the Kill Switch albums and Hate Breeds on that yeah. list, and a bunch of Every Time I Die is Hot Damn. Um, yeah, does that surprise you? 
And, and, and does it like do it's, you, do you it's think weird. it still holds up after all these years? You know, as far as like a I'm, metalcore album. I'm a hard person to ask because I was very critical of that record. I don't think it the performances and the sound. Like for me, it's it's, it's like you know. I don't. I, I'm going to be 100 honest. I don't identify with that anymore. Yeah, it's something that's part of my past that I have a great appreciation and respect for because of. Uh, in all honesty, I wouldn't be doing this tour today if that record hadn't done what it done mm-hmm. because it was like one thing led to another, led to another, led to another, and then like suddenly I'm here and I'm doing, you know, cool big things for me and my my uh, my professional life, right? But it, yeah, it's surprising, bro. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. It's super surprising. Like especially I especially because you guys were like, so young, right? You're like 15, 17 years old writing and recording that thing, and you know, it's it, 18, 18, 18, 19. Okay. 18, 19. Yeah. It was 18, 19 for most of us. I think Ryan was like 21, 22. Jeff and I are around the same age. Derek was a little younger. Derek was probably like 17. Um, it's super surprising. Like, I mean, I I like I said, I have a I'm I'm humbled and there's a lot of appreciation for it. And to me, like I mean, like how many people get to say like, oh, I made a record in, as a teenager and it, it influenced an entire genre of music. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's just that's just like I said, it's just like, wow, I, I was part of something really special and cool. Yeah. Like ego aside, whatever aside, it's just like until the day that I died that I will be affiliated with that record. And it'll always regardless if I identify with the music, I'll always have like very like deep appreciation and admiration for yeah. it. Well, and also musically, I mean, like you said, it's like your, well, it's the band's, you know, first, uh, not first release, but first like full length album <clears throat> and like, you know, playing styles and all that other stuff change over time per record each even. So it's like, yeah, yeah. I can see how it's not something that you kind of like want to, uh, you know, want to go back and be like, this is our best work because it's probably technically in your mind, not your best work. It just kind of like worked. You know what I mean? Like the whole it, album dude. worked at the time. Right place, right time, right sound. Oh, yeah. That's really what it what it boils down to. We didn't invent anything. We didn't fucking do anything. We were just right place, right sound, right time. Um, and that's and that's really. And I think I also too. I think that that allows us because I know everybody. I could kind of speak for everybody else in the band. There's a detachment of ego when it comes to that because it's like I, I know everybody else feels the same. It's just kind of like whoa, like cool. We did something really rad. There's yeah. there's a lot of humility. And there's a lot of um, just respect for it. Um, so one of the big songs on that is Nerdy, obviously. And, the, and, and I mm-hmm. want to say the title track because uh, that thing just comes out of nowhere. You know, if you put the CD in right away, yeah. uh, that first that first track is going to kick you in the nuts, okay. so to speak. Um, yeah, yeah. But how different would, would everything be if, like, you guys didn't write Nerdy, you know, that love song Nerdy? Um, like, how different would it have been for the band in that record, do you think? I don't know, to be honest. I have no idea. Um, I mean, obviously, it's it's a it's the centerpiece of that record. There's a few songs that are centerpiece. That and then uh, "Artist Rending of Me." Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those two are like the two. I don't know. I want to say most. Oh, that and "Slice Paper Wrist." Those three are singles. kind of like the. Yeah, yeah. You'd say singles, and then it, there's other sort of transitional pieces, like the first song, like twelve twenty three ninety three, which it. That's how that's what leads into it. And then Wish for Wings is like the next one that, you know, it's it just kind of like yeah. leads you from one to another to another. Um, it'd probably be really different. I mean, who knows if it would have had the same impact? Maybe it would have, maybe it wouldn't have. I, I have no, I really have no, uh, no idea. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think too much about that because like it happened the way it happened with those set of songs. And, mm-hmm. and you know, we're here today talking about it. So, like I said, like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I guess coulda, shoulda, coulda, woulda, whatever. Like, but this is what it is. In this reality, that's how it happened. You know what I mean? This yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, exactly. Exactly. Um, it, so it's rumored to like uh, tear from the red cost you like six grand to make or whatever to record and everything like that. How much did um, did the opposite cost? Was it half that? Was it was it recorded in someone's garage? You know, sometimes when no, I no, first, no. When I, sometimes when yeah. I first heard it, it sounds so you know raw I, like it, shit it, yeah You're like <laughs> it sounds so like shit like it has that fucking garage the garage vibe to it but again no, i mean it, that it, it works it worked for that whole time that whole like because oh, totally. this, this music was like kind of new at that time you know what i mean it just kind of it was it works yeah i don't know how to say it any other way but yeah uh, what do we what was that record i forget it was probably like 
I don't know, two to three grand. Mm -hmm. Um, We were in the studio, like, set up one day, track drums in one day, track guitar in one day, track, like, I think we did all the basic tracking, maybe about a week, if that, and then mixing and mastering was, like, really quick as well. Um, And we recorded it at this place called Studio 13 in Papano Beach, Florida, where it's, like, where all the bands went, like, Morning Again went there, Shia Lude went there, um, who else went there? like a ton of bands that that was just where you go to record for mm-hmm. an affordable amount of money at the time to get like a good sounding record. And we, like, guys, we couldn't go to like the bigger studios. Cause the, I, that was like thousands of dollars per day. I think at Jeremy's, it was like maybe like 40 bucks a day or something like ridiculously cheap. And he was doing all the bands that we liked and yeah. there was recordings were sounding good, you know? So was that, um, were you guys, when you guys were recording it, were you already signed to Trust Kill by that point, or was it something that you guys were doing and then you shopped nope. that record? So what happened was that was supposed to go to Good Life. Okay. And somewhere along the way, we had gotten word back to us that Josh Gravel from Trust, uh, Kill. Trust Kill was it was interested in picking up the record. Um, I forget what was going on at the time. I think we were just dissatisfied with Good Life because it's like you pay for a record. We paid for that. We, you know, we paid for distance. We sent it to him. And I think that like, I think it royalties. We just got here, here's CDs. You get CDs to sell. Here's some 12 inches. It was like, it was very like, you know, like young kids being taken advantage of. First time around. So, yeah. And I think also too, I think that when we were listening to opposite, I don't think I knew it at the time, but I think Derek had a better idea of like, we kind of have something here. Yeah. And it just so happened that, you know, Trust Kill was interested, and like we weren't firm with Good Life. There's, it was, a, it was a verbal handshake through email contract. So at that point, it was like, uh, and Josh was like, "Yeah, I have contracts. We could do two solid, and then an option, and then I'll do that." You know, it was like mm-hmm. it seemed more legitimate, and it was also U.S. based because yeah, like yeah. we started, we wanted to start building the band in the U.S. Like, it also cool, be difficult to fucking... just to deal with someone who's like international in general, just because again. At this particular time, the internet was nowhere near what it is now. So communication no. was still kind of, yeah, you know. All email, you know, you're booking tours through a AIM instant messenger. <laughs> you know, it was like, that's, I mean, that's how we did our first few tours. It was that. And like, when I was in high school, we would, when I was a senior in high school, I would take off Friday. I was, I'm sorry. I would take off, yeah, I would take off Friday and Monday. We'd leave Thursday, drive up, play a show in Philadelphia at some fucking VFW hall. Go to New York City, play at CBGB's, turn around, come back, play some fucking small bar in or small VFW hall in like, you know, Virginia Beach or somewhere, and I would be back in school on Tuesday. Yeah, that's, that's basically that's how my senior year was for the most part. Yeah, and it was like, yeah, you know, it was growing. It was growing. Like I was in high, I was high school, played CBGB's. It's fucking awesome. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who wouldn't like, want to do that? You know what I mean? But yeah, ex- ex- dude, exactly. You exactly. don't do that so, forever. <laughs> Not forever, but I mean, you can't do it. Obviously, it's a John Varvatos store now. Yeah. Kind of, kind of interesting. Um, so, what's the different? Can you explain the transition between like the sound? Like we kind of touched base on it a little bit, but between like opposite and tear from the red, like how that yeah. kind of matured? Because once that came out, once opposite came out, you guys were just like, like you, we said earlier, you were catching, you rode the wave, and it was just kind of like, you know, just like this. Your your fan base or your, whatever your how you were perceived is up, 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 up. And you guys are touring all the time. So like, I was wondering, mm-hmm. you know, did that have anything to do with, um, you know, the sound obviously becoming more just going out into the world in general, but also like playing with all these other bands and experiencing all this yeah. other shit. So like, what was the different, like what made the, the change so, so much from hard, from if, metalcore to like post hardcore, whatever you want to call it. If I'm, if I, I, you know, this is my memory and this is obviously going back like, you know, many, many years. So I could be wrong, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I, I think it more has to do with like all of us being into hardcore and being kids. And like you said, then you start touring and you start going out there. And if I remember, if I'm recalling this correctly, Derek was a very, very big Deftones fan when he was in his early teens. And then he, I think he got really heavily into hardcore. And then I think he kind of made a circle back around and like rediscovered, say, Deftones and really was like, this is cool. Like, this is kind of what we're doing, but it's more like it's more of this direction. And he got heavily into it. And 
the writing process for Opposite was very much me, Derek, and Jeffrey wrote songs. Me, Ryan, and Jeffrey wrote songs. And then we put those songs together and they worked. Mm-hmm. Well, the process when we going into Tear from the Red was Derek had some ideas. He'd bring them to brand practice. And then we would just start building them. Ryan would be like, no, don't do this chord. I know this really bizarre fucking full atonal chord that we can do. I could put over this. And then this goes from being like a basic chord progression to this really weird open thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, with drums, I'd be like, I could do this here. Like, what if we did this here? And then Jeffrey would do the vocals and he would kind of collaborate with Derek and Ryan. So it was like Derek would would be the idea guy coming in with the, the ideas for the songs. And then we would all kind of come up and then assemble it and have it be what it was. Okay. Sort of. Okay. Um, with the exception of Botula. Botula was, that was the main song off of Tear from the Red. That was pretty much, that was Ryan's riff. That was his idea. The intro, intro was, I think, Jeffrey's idea with the I adore her and the, you know, small guitar, but the chords and the thing. That was, that was pre Mac. But every other song off that record, that was like Derek coming in, like, I have this idea. You know, I'm thinking this, this is this. And then we'd all kind of get together and then turn it into what it was. Crazy. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, bringing up Bl- uh, Boshla, uh, was that your first time um, shooting like a, a real video, a music video for, for you guys, right? That was like the first time? Yeah, 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 because like in my mind at that point, like thinking back, like only really big bands had videos. Yeah. And it was that was kind of like sort of the beginnings of like, oh, well, we're going to be a band that has a video and then that video is going to be on like MTV. Yeah. Like it, it just didn't really register because you grow up watching it before you know before sort of gotten to hardcore and punk it's like you watch it and like oh Soundgarden, oh nirvana oh this oh that like oh you know whatever and then these they had videos on mtv mm-hmm. and then suddenly like yeah we're not being played alongside of them but like you're out there we have a video on mtv it was just kind of like this like oh shit this is like happening and like mtv wants to service it and this you know much music in canada wants to it was just like oh like things are kind of happening like okay yeah. cool I remember I, I can I can remember seeing because uh, again we should probably preface for anyone that's younger than we are uh, <laughs> on here um, at that particular time MTV was still kind of showing music videos it wasn't necessarily like the MTV of old but it was yeah. uh, it definitely had segments where it would show music videos and I remember like MTV MTV two one of them brought Headbangers Ball back or something like that and I remember. Yeah. Uh, I remember seeing Botchla on, like, you know, it was like midnight or something, but, you know, yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah, we never got played during, like, yeah. <laughs> normal human being hours. I think I remember a few times, like, staying up really late because, like, oh, it's going to come on at one fucking 30 in the morning. So I just dick around. Did you know ahead of time? Like, did they know, did they tell you, like, hey, programming says it's going to come on at this particular point? Um, I think we kind of knew roundabout, right? So it was like, oh, Headbangers Ball is going to be on, or, like, this is going to be on, and they're going to play this video. But Headbangers Ball was like an hour. So it's, you just have to watch the, the entire thing, yeah. time until it just came up. And you're like, oh, shit, that's cool. So what's the and experience like, right. like of seeing yourself on MTV? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like in a music video. What's that like? It, it's weird, man. Like I personally, like I'm not the guy that needs to sit on stage or be the center of attention. I like playing the drums. I like, I like that. So like it was just weird. It was just like, cool. That's OK. So that's how I look. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I just didn't really, I just didn't really care too much, you know. It yeah. was just kind of like, okay, like we, we look young and cool. Yeah, I you know, it. like all right, all right. You know, it was just kind of like that. So like, I don't, yeah, I don't really, yeah. It, it was just, it was kind of weird, and it was, I guess, anticlimactic, I suppose. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so, uh, what was the cover song that you guys nixed from Tear from the Red? And is there any kind of recording of that ever, like? anywhere did you guys actually record it or is it something you guys just never recorded because you dropped it from beforehand so the cut we did so initially uh, we were doing a cut we were going to do a split with throwdown like early lineup throwdown mm-hmm. and um one of the songs that made it onto tear from the red six and stones never made sense there was like an original sort of recorded version and alongside that we did um smashing pumpkins today uh and I think that we recorded it, we put it out, and people were kind of stoked. But I think when it came time to do the record, it was like, eh, nah, we, sh- we shouldn't really include this. So that shit just basically got shelved. I think it's somewhere on YouTube. I think you could look it up. Like, it got leaked at some point mm-hmm. when, like, the mass leaking of Napster yeah, yeah, shit yeah. happened. You, you know what I mean? Like, 
I'm pretty sh- I'm pretty sure um, I'm pretty sure it's up, it's up there. I mean, you know, it's like like a bunch of teenagers, you know. Yeah. Playing I get it. With, yeah, you know, so, <laughs> so it's not it's, it's not necessarily a uh, baby got back part 2 with throwdowns. It's just uh the No, no, no yeah. that was that was definitely way more entertaining and, and way cooler, for sure. <laughs> um, for sure. So, Terror from the Road was a pivotal time for you all as a band and you guys like definitely toured a lot more. Um, yeah. How does that play into the band going forward around that time from 2001 to 2003? Like going forward after that record is out. Um, it was cool because Hatebreed um, was very, very cool enough to take us on two different tours, and that greatly helped because it was obviously a bit of a co-sign. And on top of it, like uh, Satisfaction was fucking blowing the fuck up. Yeah. It was selling a ton of fucking records, and uh, Jamie and those dudes. Because the lineup has changed a little bit since. Right. I think it was like Sean, Sean, Jamie, Matt, Beatty, and then oh, fuck, I can't, I forget, I can't remember his name. Boulder, one of the guitar player, he passed away, I think, uh, some time ago. Uh, yeah, they just brought us on tour, and they were super cool. They were super nice to us. They were just really great dudes. It was like they were just like kind of like the older, tougher brothers, kind of like mentoring us. Yeah. So that definitely helped a bit. That definitely helped, and then we would, you know, I forget what other stuff we did. I think we toured that band, Kitty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we toured with that's them. That's a big band we on t- the message board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We toured with Kitty, and like I think on that tour it was like Kitty headlining us, and then Kill Switch, and then like Shadows Fall. You know, not nice. Shadows or not Shadows Fall, but Kill Switch is just like fucking ginormous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we were able to do some tours like that that really kind of helped push us forward, and, and it helped sell records. And it started, you know, uh, getting the attention of like labels like, you know, Atlantic right. or like DreamWorks was interested in us. And like there was a few kind of other smaller labels that kind of popped up that sort of taking notice like, OK, well, this band's independent and their first record sold, you know, I think at the time opposite probably sold like 20,000, which was a big deal for a, at the time. Oh, like, yeah. For you know, a hardcore no band. Too. Yeah, for sure. Totally. And then I think the goal for Tear was to hit like 50,000. I'm pretty sure we did. I don't, I don't, I actually haven't checked the sound scan. Maybe the sound scan isn't up to what it is, but I mean, obviously, you know, distros at the shows yeah, yeah. back in the day and selling them. I think we were able to hit our mark. Yeah. Were, so, those, even, yeah, were those even charted towards like sound scan even way back in the day? Like, did you have the ability to somehow get those numbers back to them? Um, no. Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> I don't, I don't think that no. was something that was going on. No, 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 no. I mean, you could like, so basically what would happen was at a show, this is kind of how it was back in the day. I don't know if this, this is probably not a thing anymore because obviously people don't really sell records. But say <laughs> you would fill out sound scan like papers of like, okay, well, we have 100 CDs with us and we sold 10. But you always anticipated people pirating it, like downloading it off Napster or the records that were just like, you know, that just didn't get accounted for. So you always inflate your numbers, yeah. but you never went overboard. You just kind of kept it in a realistic sort of way. So if you were to check Nielsen sound scan right now, and just like to say hypothetically, like opposite is that like 40,000 records, I'd say realistically, it's probably actual units, probably closer to maybe 60. Mm-hmm. But then if you account for all the torrenting, all the torrenting, all the streaming, all the everything. It's uh, up there. It's, it's up there. I, I, real, I think realistically, like you could say it's like unofficially close to gold, if not gold. Yeah. Because I remember at a time we would look on torrenting sites and it'd be like Poison the Wall catalog, 60,000 downloads. And it would be like opposite <laughs> December, Tear from the Red, yeah. you know, You Come Before You and whatever, you know, the newer record was. And I remember seeing a bunch of those where it's like 60,000, 30,000, fucking, you know, 10,000. Like, and it's like, whoa, we were like, holy shit. Like, so you got to think like, copies that were out there collectively from the past 20 years i i'd say probably close to you know half a million yeah that's realistically pro- it's, it's pretty safe to say that does does like the pirating of music did that does that affect do you have like a a negative outlook on that or is that something that maybe you think helped your band you know oh it totally at, helped infant stage yeah so infant stage when napster was like a thing i remember we would 2000 2001 we were on tour we were actually we were on tour at martyr ad i specifically remember and we would play a show and then we would go to like a house party after and i remember kids would come up to me or come up to jeff or whomever and say dude like i downloaded your shit off of fucking napster this is so cool 
So it definitely helped kind of like perpetuate, uh, per per uh, perpetuate the record and the band a bit. Um, long term, I mean, it's, it's the future. Yeah. It's, it's where things went. Like, yeah, people aren't torrenting and downloading. It's, it's, it's sort of evolved into sort of the streaming, you know, where we are with streaming with Spotify and Apple Music and, and or and all that sort yeah. of shit. Um, but it's, it's, it was the infant stages of where things eventually went. So it's like when that shift happens, when there's like a, a complete, you know, way of consuming music when it starts, it's like, you can't really stop it because become, it's just the momentum starts building. So I just look at it as like embracing it. Yeah. It's like, okay, well we missed the whole era where that didn't exist and people sold records and you know, you could sell half a million, a million records. Like we weren't part of that, whatever, not a big deal. We're part of this whole other thing and for better or for worse, we're, this is sort of the, um, the framework that we're existing in. Yeah. So, you know, like once again, it's like maybe in a different reality, like, things would have been different. We would have made more money, but like, it's not the reality that we exist in. So I'm just, I'm grateful for the positive um, effects that it had on our band. Yeah. I mean, it could have gone, it could have gone the other way too. Like not that many more people would have heard about you and they may have not shown up your shows or, you know, this out of the other and spent money in other yeah. ways. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what positive or negative mm -hmm. effect it had, like in terms of like full scale, but I know it had more of a positive in terms of like the band getting out there. Yeah. Like I said, it may have affected it financially a little bit negatively, but also too, it's like we're a bunch of kids going through Trust Kill Records. Like, I mean, yeah, what, you know I, what I'm saying? You're like, not gonna make a million bucks that way. You know what I mean? So no, nah, no, no, no. Unfortunately, so in that time, uh, in that time frame, you guys seem to to have done enough to catch the eye, like you were saying, of DreamWorks of Atlantic. And they decided yeah. to take a chance with you guys. Um, how did that work between you and Trustkill? I mean, I you kind of mentioned it earlier. Uh, they kind of signed you to like a two record deal with an option, this, that, or the other. Um, if I remember correctly, it's something. It's something like that. I think the op, the EP, it was an EP option or something like that. It was two firm full lengths and then like an EP option. But there was no like uh, kind of like bad ill will split or anything like that. Or you you didn't have to get bought out of a contract by Atlantic. Well. Actually, no, no, no. I, I, I'm thinking about it now. There was a time clause. That's what it was. So all three were firm. Two full lengths and the EP were firm up until a certain time. Mm -hmm. And we rec I, I think that was one of the last contracts that jo Josh had issued. And we just so happened to get the, one, the right one at the right time. Or most of our advance that we had gotten from Atlantic to like record and live and all that shit – it probably a majority of it probably would have went to Josh. Okay. But it just so happened it just so happened that he drew up a fucking stupid contract. <laughs> we just so we just so we just so happened to get lucky. Yeah. Uh, in terms of bad blood with him, I mean, not saying that I didn't see that there was anything. I was just curious as to because I you know it, I was I didn't really remember it was only two records and and usually you know I mean nowadays people they'll sign people to multi deal like multi record deals but. Again, I yeah. guess I wasn't really up to date on like how long record contracts were for, you know, back in the 2003 days. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the parting was fine. I think, um, you know, obviously there's a history with Josh and other bands involved with Trust Kill. I mean, it's it's well documented yeah, over the years. Sure. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't I, I don't think there's any need to get into it, as I'm sure people with a decent imagination can kind of figure out. Um, but you guys had nothing really like that on your end with them did you no oh, we totally did that's what i'm saying oh, okay, is that okay, i don't okay. i don't i don't, don't want to go into specifics about I it gotcha. i don't want to go into specifics but obviously bleeding through throw down all these Google bands it. have they, they have a gripe and you know usually that stuff is not just um to one specific band it's it's a it's a general way of behaving towards other bands gotcha. i don't know his personal reasons why i don't know how his business is run i know as of this day I don't have any ill will towards the guy. I don't hate him. I don't have any issues. We, like our company owns, like basically when Trust Kill went under, the rights to the masters reverted back to us. So right. myself, Ryan, and Jeffrey uh, own the physical masters for Tear from the Red and Opposite of December and Distance. You weren't storing so, those in the uh, in the lot on Universal when it caught fire, right? You didn't have them stored there or anything, right? No, no, no. I mean, to be honest, uh, 
opposite was recorded on a one inch tape that I think Alan had for a while. I don't know if he still has it. I don't even know if there's any technology that does playback on that. <laughs> and then uh, the tear from the red was recorded on an early version of Pro Tools. So who even knows if the tra- if, say if for some reason the hard drive still exists? Mm-hmm. Who even knows if it, it would fucking open up? Yeah, so, yeah, not uh, the updates it, uh, haven't really, you know. Yeah, the, so un- unfortunately, 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 like when we did the reissue on Rise, we literally had to take it off of original CDs because it's like no, no, nothing existed. Mm. Even the original artwork that Jake from Converge did, those files I don't even think even existed either. So we really had Is that to why like. It was all different, like the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. The two. We didn't want. We didn't really. We that's what well, we, I mean. Obviously, when you reissue a record, like you have to do kind of something special. So that's why we kind of put them together. But I think it just it made more sense to put them out as a combined release. And then when it came to the artwork as well, it's like, all right, well, we don't have the originals of anything. Like we can't really do much. We're limited, but we want to get this out so that people can actually, you yeah. know, have it. And then I think we did like a remaster, like Will Putney, like we remastered it. And then that's it. I mean, to be perfectly honest. You know, me and Jeffrey and Ryan really, really want to re-release Opposite and Tear on, uh, do like a, a vinyl, an individual vinyl release because we licensed that stuff to rise, but that those terms are up, but we've been trying. And I know people have asked about this. So this might be another question, uh, yeah, on your is. list of questions. It's like, we've been trying to get the right, basically in a nutshell, we own the three records. Okay, cool. We could do whatever the fuck we want with them. The issue is. Uh, WIA, which is Warner Electric Atlantic, whatever, owns the rights to You Come Before You. And then when Ferret went under, it got, they absorbed versions and they absorbed Tropic Rot. Mm. So they own, they own the masters to those records. We technically own the songs. So I'm sure, I mean, we'd obviously have to go through the contracts, but if we wanted to re record some of that stuff, but there are songs. Yeah. We own them. We could do whatever we want, but we can't use artwork. Um, as I understand it, we can't use music or artwork in terms of like re-releasing like anything. So that's kind of where we've been for a while. We're trying to get our entire catalog onto one place and then do a full vinyl reissue with special stuff. Like nice. Jeffrey and I have passes and he has lyrics and I have photos, and maybe put together like a cool little book or a poster or do something do something very special for that stuff. It's just yeah. been we've been in limbo because basically um, we uh, won't play ball. Let me just put leave it that. Let me leave, leave, put it that way. We'll do. It's very. They won't license. They won't license the records to us in the way that we want them licensed. Let's just kind of leave it at that. We'll do. So we're trying. We're trying. We're trying to get it, and we're trying to do like a full reissue. Um, but we're just in such a fucking difficult, hard spot because yeah. it's like we own half our records, and the other half of the records we don't own. I mean, if we had a ton of money, we could kind of re-record it and probably put it out. We'd have to check the contracts because they might own, there might be some sort of clause where you can't record it for, re-record this for a certain amount of time or ever, who knows, you know, because all the legalese, you'd have to get our lawyer to go over it. Right. I definitely, that's definitely was the, one of the questions, especially for like, uh, you come before you inversions, I think, or, or, and, uh, Tropic Rot, uh, some people were asking if you were ever going to do reissues of those. Cause, uh, we want to. Yeah. We want to, but it, like, it's w- like one of the many things of like, of us dealing with like trying to get on the same page and write music and do all, you know, be on. That's one of the many things that's like we've been trying for years to get this going. Like, yeah, you know, we could do it with Opposite and Terror. And a lot of people like those records. We could do it with Distance, even though that's like, it's part of the history of the band, but it's a, a less cared about part of the band. Right. We could, you know, kind of reissue those three together and do something cool. But we'd like to do everything, right. you know, and we're just trying to hold out and hold out. And maybe one day if it happens then we could kind of get everything out and it's awesome. And, you know, all this sort of special stuff and remixed and maybe remastered or just remastered and just kind of like give something new to kids that like what we do. But, yeah, we're, we're in a holding pattern, essentially. I get you. It's definitely uh, as a collector of vinyl myself, finding any of your stuff outside of the reissued um reissued opposite and tear is like very hard on ebay or discogs or anything like that unless you want to pay like yeah. 100 bucks but you know what i mean yeah i mean i wouldn't even pay 100 bucks for my own <laughs> record so you know fuck i've almost done it a couple of times so uh it is what it is but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so for the next record you guys uh, after tear you, it was you coming for you you guys and i don't want to pronounce their names wrong by any means but um i'm gonna try to pronounce them 
Um, Pele Hendrickson and Esco Lubstrom. There you go. Esco and Pele. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> you guys were able to, uh, link up with them in, uh, in Sweden and whatnot. And they're most, uh, they're better known for working with the refused on a couple albums. Um, yep. But did you guys, it, you guys wrote most or, and maybe recorded most of you come before you in California. Right. And then you went over to, mm-hmm. uh, Sweden and started working with them. Um, yep. What was the purpose? What was their purpose in that album? Um, so bring, so originally we wanted them to kind of come in because we liked how we liked, we liked how, um, the shape of punk to come by refuse sounded. And we also compared contrast, you know, fan the flames to shape of punk to come. They had more of an involvement with shape. So in our minds, we're like, these guys are doing something really interesting. We like the way the production sounds and so on and so forth. So there was a few people that were on the list. I think we're talking like Mark Trombino, who did like all the Jimmy World stuff. Mm -hmm. Those dudes, there was like a few other names being kind of tossed around because we kind of wanted to work with somebody that understood what our band was about and could like take us to the next level, but also like keep it creative and interesting. So yeah, we brought them in and right off the bat, it was like, you know, we're young kids. Like we're, you know, I had time, I think I was like 22, 23, something like that. And they were just saying, Hey, here's this idea for this thing. You're trying to take it in like the most obvious direction. What if we went over fucking here? What if we went left, mm-hmm. you know? And it, and for us, we're like, Holy shit, these guys get it. And they are pushing us in these interesting directions and adding this sort of these other layers, these other textural layers to our music. And it was, um, I mean, they helped greatly with You Come Before You. You Come Before You would not have the sonic identity and have the density that it does uh, without without them. But structurally, sure. like song-wise, was it mostly the same once you got out there and you just try, kind of changed, like like you're saying, the sonic? Uh, oh, the sonic I mean, for the most, yeah, for the most part, shit was locked in. There was obviously like, <clears> hey, you should extend this a little bit more. Like, hey, you should cut this down because it's the normal, like, the normal role that a producer plays in, in trying to keep song structures efficient. Yeah. Um, they definitely played that role um, and helped push us, you know, to sort of make the songs as interesting and as good as possible for sure. Cool. But I will say, I, I'm pretty sure that they weren't the biggest fans of that record. <laughs> okay. I, Cause they're very frank individuals. Yeah. I remember, I remember having a conversation when we went to go back, excuse me, and do versions with them they seemed way more stoked on versions and how weird and how the songs were in the arrangements. Um, I remember Pele making some sort of offhand comment about how like he preferred versions over you come before you and you come before you was, I want to say dodgy, but like lacked some things that versions had structurally mm-hmm. and sonically and all that stuff. So, you know, interesting. take that for what it is. Take that for yeah. what it is. Um, speaking uh, about you come before you, um, is the artwork, the cover artwork, um, is is that anything special, or is it just some cool artwork that Dan, I'm sorry, Don Clark made up for the album, or did, did it have like some kind of meaning to it? Um, I mean, personally, no, there's no okay. meaning. It's okay. just like some fuck. It's like a sunflower dude. <laughs> the only thing I remember us talking about is we wanted, since it was coming out on Atlantic, we wanted to package it in such a way that like was reminiscent of like the older Atlantic releases, like some of the Zeppelin stuff, like or, yeah. There's like a whole, you know, the the whole sort of layout. It definitely, looked, it definitely that, looked different, and it definitely stood out within your discography for that reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 that was, I remember us talking about it, and everybody being like, "Yeah, that's really cool. We should do that." But in terms of like what he did, was like, you know, I I'm here nor there about it. Okay. I look at it, and I'm like, oh, that's you come before you. Possibly. He didn't he didn't take like any kind of like, uh, did he get like free will and just like make whatever, or did you know did someone give yeah. him kind of like. Uh, some direction at all? Uh, Derek may have given him a little bit of direction, but we, for the most part, he just kind of, he just went and did his thing. Yeah. And now, you know, now, now forever, that's the association with, um, with that record, you know? Cool. Um, you guys did a lot of strenuous touring after that as well. And, um, I know it was, um, one of those things that kind of almost made you hang it up there, uh, right after that. And, uh, on top of that, Derek actually kind of leaves the band, uh, around yeah. that time and uh he started doing 
what later became sleigh bells um and yeah. whatnot which is also like you know mind-blowing in general but um yeah what got, what made you guys push on like after all that um obviously it's all, a big thing it's like we're familiar with it it's all we knew <laughs> we love doing it we love making music with one another i think derek leaving we gained a, a better appreciation for who we were as people and who we were as a musicians and like the, the sort of common musical vision that we wanted to sort of pers- you know pursue. But a big thing that like not a lot of people realize is like the sound of poison well comes from Ryan, like all those weird chords and all the, 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 like that, the, the actual music, not to say that Derek didn't do anything and take it in his own direction and do something really great with it. But the core sound that's, that's Ryan. Like the tones you know? and like the structure and all that other stuff is. Well, just like, you know, when you hear, you hear poison, well, there's like, poison well chords like there's yeah. these weird chords and these weird like you know particular chords that you hold and then chord progressions that you're like oh that sounds like poison well that would yeah. be a poison well that's that comes from rhyme so i think it was the uh, it was it was understanding that like yeah derek was a big part and he helped influence and now he is making a transition to in, in pursuing something musically that is more what he wants to do but we still want to do this we still like heavy music we still like really interesting heavy music um can we do it you know we want to do it can we do it and it was a matter of just getting ryan to sort of you know because he essentially at that point he had to pick up the the stick and be like okay right. here's this song i have a song idea and then us kind of do what we did you know because poison Wall was always four dudes right. it's just Derek was a very big part but not the only part because obviously we continued on and we wrote stuff right. um so yeah it was just a matter of just ryan just you know like I guess uh, getting the courage because it's intimidating. Yeah, you, you kind of have to pick up. It's all on your shoulders, then all of a sudden. It's on your shoulders. Yeah, it's all on your shoulders. So you know, I, I applaud him and, and what he put out there. Like I said, for better or for worse, is is very musically interesting. Yeah. So um, it's and again, you come before you is your highest kind of like debut on the Billboard charts. Um, yeah. Yet you only did the one record with Atlantic. Uh, and I yeah. know you guys kind of like split and you kind of, you guys kind of cited uh, creative differences for the most part, but they did yep. let you have a lot of control on the writing of that. It, it kind of seemed. And um, mm-hmm. was it something that, I mean, cause it again is your highest debuted, you know, album. Is it something that yep. they just weren't willing to work with you on like going forward or did they, they want to change things going forward to maybe heighten yeah. the, the I, situation? So, so I think that, in hindsight, because hindsight's always twenty twenty, <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't have we shouldn't have we shouldn't have signed to Atlantic because what we wanted to do was to do weird creative stuff. So like an epitaph or a vagrant or whatever, whatever home that would suit us, that would they would they would have money for us to be able to do the things that we wanted to do and do the tours that we wanted to do. We should have done that. Going to a major label, when we went to the major label, I guess everybody's headspace was over here. We have the potential to become really fucking big. And we could do it on our terms. And they let us do that with You Come Before You. There is no interference. Literally, we pulled up to Sound City. We had Pele and Eskel. Uh, you know, the band was there. Our manager was there from time to time. I think, you know, two of the dudes came in at one point and, like, listened to a playback of a song and, like, kind of, like, you know, kind of out of time, like, bobbed their heads <laughs> up and down. And they fucking and, – and then they left. Like, I don't think they understood it. But I think they understood like the hype that was behind the band yeah. and then the tours. And so they, they, they were just like, OK, this is weird. You guys obviously know what you're doing. There was a game plan of like doubling. So the whole objective, obviously, you want to sell a ton of records. But the whole objective for you before you was to double what we did with care. So we crossed the 100,000 uh, record mark, which we did. I think, we are, yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. like run 120 or 130 yeah, or something like that. It's like 120,000 like right now, uh, as far as like those stats go. But again, like we were saying earlier, yeah. it's probably way inflated. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably way more with like all that sort of shit. So um, they didn't fuck with us. And we kind of thought it was going to be business as usual for versions. Or let me just kind of say there's an in between record that didn't really get put out. Mm-hmm. But that then that was a record that was written with Derek with a bunch of material that we didn't do anything with. Actually, no, one song and actually ended up making it on versions. And because it was Ryan's song. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, no, we just didn't, we, they wanted us to play a ball and we, and we didn't. And, you know, I'm not going to say that there wasn't some sort of maybe 
say collective self destruct button that had kind of been set <laughs> off with all the all the bullshit, you know, father dying, major band member leaving, um, leaving a label, like all this like life altering, like changing shit, you know, like you know, people go down a little bit of a destructive road. I can't say that I I didn't do that myself a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I think in that it was just kind of like, well, you want us to do this? Well, we're going to do that. Which, like hindsight, you sign up with my major label, you should probably play ball. Yeah. If you're not going to play ball, uh, we should assign to an independent. Mm-hmm. And then we'd probably be more, we probably, if we would have been a, a bit better with like seeing the long term, we probably would have been in a position like every time I die. Okay. Where they, they, do, they do what they do. And they're uh, they're supported. I think I believe they're on Epitaph. Mm-hmm, they're supported mm-hmm. by Epitaph. They get the money that they need to do the records and the capacity. They can do whatever the fuck they want. And they, their trajectory has just been slowly just fucking going up yeah. and up and up and up and up. Like they made a, a lot of smart, uh, creative and and, uh, and smart business decisions with their band. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, and even that being said, though, Epitaph, I remember around this time too, where like. And again, we already talked about you guys being on MTV, and it just seemed like an influx of that kind of genre, that the genre was being on MTV a lot more. And I kind of felt like, okay, uh, the majors are wanting to take a stab at like getting their little hands in, in, in that the hardcore scene. And, and of course, they would have like, no idea let's, what's let's, going on. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's make, we want to make money. What's this thing? Here's yeah, this new thing. Yeah. We want to make money. You know, that's, that's, that's essentially. That's essentially they didn't, they didn't know. They didn't but it came and went really quick. I feel like with the majors, but and I think that might have helped um, other smaller labels become bigger too at some point. Because I remember like Epitaph just being like the old school, uh, you know, old school punk record label, hardcore record label. But they weren't necessarily yeah. as huge as they were like when they signed Every Time I Die or something like that. So you know, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember like when I was a kid, it was just like bands like Rancid mm-hmm. or. Pennywise, like, I think no effects. Like that. Pennywise, no effects. Like all these, like sort of, you know, there was this. Like, you listen to the the punkorama, yeah, 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 and it would be all these bands, and that was kind of the thing. But like much like same like with Victory, where like you think of Victory, I think of Victory as Earth Crisis, Snap Case, Early Refuse, Strife. Um, what is it? Dead. I think Dead Guy. Like I, that's the era that I think of Victory Records. Completely whereas, different now. Yeah, well, even when it made the switch, it was like Hawthorne Heights and all these like other bands. It's I'll like uh, you and all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like the shift. They're like, okay, this is where the thing, this is where it's going. So this is where this is where business is taking us. Yeah, interesting. Um, <coughs> so that all being said, let me see where we're at. Blah, blah blah. You had done some. You had done all. You all had done some pre-production with uh, Derek, but scrapped a lot mm-hmm. of those ideas. Did any of those make it to recording with Pele and Eskel in in that time frame? Because I know um, you guys did some recording prior, right, to versions. Yeah. So yeah, so there's a there's an unreleased record that sits in between "You Come Before You" and versions, and that record is me, Derek, and Ryan and Jeff. And I think that's where things where the band were the most unhealthiest. And Derek was very very unhappy. He was starting to, to get the itch to do something musically different. And he wanted to start implementing what he thought the band should be and taking more of a heavy handed where a uh, heavy handed approach in how he wanted it to sort of play out. So like I said, every other poison World record was collectively four dudes. Well, this in between record was basically Derek saying, sing this, play that, do this, do that. And everybody was, we were doing pre-production and everybody wasn't happy, including him. Yeah. It wasn't the right, it wasn't the right situation. Um, and we had the Swedes, we flew them out. We were doing pre-production in a house that they were living in. And I remember I visited some family in Canada and I came back and I was just like, I was living in California at the time. Um, cause this was all happening out in Riverside, California. Um, and uh, I remember getting a call to come over and I remember seeing Derek and he was he was weeping and it was just like Miller's just like, yeah, I can't do this. And, you know, we kind of was like it was like celebrating somebody that was as a band as we were perceiving it. So Ce- celebrating somebody that was dead, but they weren't really dead yet. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. was just it was very it was very it was a very bizarre thing. And Derek was like, yeah, you know, maybe play a last show and do this and do that. And I forget what happened. And he left to go back to like West Palm Beach, Florida, like just literally just got in his truck, put his shit in and drove back. And then it was me, me, Ryan and uh, and Jeffrey. And we're like, well, 
and that's and that's where you know we kind of went off and wanted to you know continue on but in back in terms of that middle record to your original question of did any of that material make it off two songs so one song uh that is called riverside that's on Mm -hmm. versions which has like horns and it's very kind of like a westerny kind of song that was on those demos and then another song that derek had had uh, made it onto the first. He reworked it, but it made its way onto the very first Slay Bells record. I forget. I don't know the oh, wow. name of the song. So, like, he took a song, and then we took a song, and everything got scrapped, and then somehow it got fucking leaked That's on the internet. Say, so yeah. it's, I remember it's like a there. demo floating around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's it's not it's not it's. I mean, there's a reason why it didn't get released. But now, some of those, at least, I would. I feel like some of those tracks in, ended up on the. Um, the one of three, two of three, three of three kind of like little no. none. Because some of them had the no, same no. title, I thought. Like a, number A1 um, or whatever or whatever. There are a couple titles that were the same, I felt. We're, oh, we're thinking of two different demos. We're thinking of two different demos. Okay. So, th- so, so, okay. so the demos that I'm talking about, I think it's a collection of like two to four songs that were me, Derek, Ryan, Jeffrey, that we did Hold before on. Derek. I'm going to look them up because I, <laughs> I don't Yeah, so them. there's... So the second set of demos are called the Steakhouse Demos. And that is with me, Ryan, Jeff, this dude named Jason Boyer that played in Target Nevada, which is a hardcore band from Florida, Uh that he eventually took Derek's place. And uh, our friend Ben, who was just a dude that lived in California that played bass, Atlantic had given us money to go do demos. Mm -hmm. And somehow those demos ended up... It's so weird. It's like none of the shit I leaked. I'm pretty sure Jeffrey didn't leak anything. I don't know if Ryan... But somehow these like... Demos just end up on the internet fucking mysteriously. I can remember when they did, too, because I downloaded them off SoulSeek, which is crazy because I literally recently just re-downloaded them off SoulSeek, too. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, like, uh, what is it? Ocean Breast, Punker, Break, yeah. Rockfuck, yeah, those, of, all those? Yeah, those. So, okay, so those songs, the story with those songs is those are the first, that was the first uh, batch of songs that we wrote for versions. Okay. We went and did demos. We submitted to Atlantic. They're like, eh, we don't. We don't hear the hit, obviously. There's no fucking hit in there. <laughs> There's no, no hit at all. Um, and then we started writing more and more and more. We eventually got the money to go to Sweden to start what would have been the first seven to eight songs. Um, not in order, but like seven, eight songs that made it to um, versions. But we recorded more. I think we recorded like, I don't know, 12, 13 songs. Excuse me. Maybe. But some of those in our mind was like, eh, they don't fit or they don't do this. Or like, it just there's just a lack of congruency with the overall theme of versions where those songs just didn't play a role. So I, I remember having those songs and yeah, the six songs that eventually made it to one one, two of two, three yeah. three. And there was some sort of record store day thing that yep. we had been approached about, and we're like, well, yeah, why don't we just get them mixed and then just kind of put out as a record store day thing, and then do the seven inches, and that's it. You yeah. know what I mean? So that's kind of the story. That's sort of the story with that whole sort of period of time. Yeah, because I remember uh, those demos just hitting the internet, and then I remember versions coming out, and I remember thinking maybe like, okay, well, one maybe like one of those songs maybe made it on versions or some shit, or, or a couple of those songs were on versions, and then I remember the uh, one of one what that EP, those EPs coming out or whatever you want to call yeah, them, yeah. and I was like, oh, these must be like what those were supposed to be or something like that, but. That's interesting. No, no, no. That was those are the leftover. I would say those are the leftover scraps that didn't fit, or musically, some of us felt were inferior to what was on versions. But as releasing them as like record store day or like a set of seven inches, like they served that purpose. Uh, yeah. And in, in, in releasing them and like in doing that, like okay, well they don't fit here, but they they do this, so we're just going to put them out. Yeah. Well, I will say. Um... Alex, uh, he posted about the Purple Sabbath. Is that what it is? Yeah. He recently just posted about it, saying that that song didn't get the well-deserved praise it should have gotten. So. Nah, you you know why though? Because that song <laughs> is named after Black Sabbath. It's Purple Sabbath, so it's not as heavy as Black Sabbath. So that's probably why. It's a, it's a great song. I mean, I I, I enjoy those. Uh, I, I Bowie off of that is like one of my favorite poison the well tracks oddly enough because it's just you know yeah. as i got older i got more into like not everything has to be metalcore hardcore type situation yeah, too, yeah. but it's a great song same, same thing for me like that whole era of those songs like versions and then those 
Bowie's probably one of one or you know probably top three uh, favorite songs because oh. it's just it's a really beautiful song. It just didn't fit. It, it did. It just it was just trying to find its place in the record. And like I said, it just yeah, it just yeah. didn't fucking fit. You, I mean <laughs> that that particular time right there, man. You guys were doing like re- it just felt like the mo- you guys did mel- melody like really well, you know, for like a band like you guys. It was just there's a lot of mm-hmm. things hitting. I thought on versions and the, that three song EP situation or whatever you want to call this. Yeah. Um, that being said, versions and the three song EP had a much different vibe than the previous three records. Um, now, yeah. now we know that uh, Derek had left the band, but was working with Pele and, and Exel like a, a big point of that? Like, you know, and I know you probably don't like that album as much as all the other ones, but like, uh, mm-hmm. what what made that album so weird? Because this is also the first time you're adding extra instruments such as like banjos, horns, mandolins, and yeah. like piano and it's stuff extra, like that to it. Extra, extra layering. Um, w- oh, sorry, repeat, <laughs> repeat the question. <laughs> Just did working with. Uh, oh, working with those dudes yeah. help. It did. Yeah, it was it, that uh, that to me when I when I listened back to that record. That is like a Ryan Premack slash Pele Hendrickson record. Like those are the two dudes steering the ship. I'd say a little bit more so Ryan, but also too Pele had a lot to to offer. Mm-hmm. Um, that was that to me. That's Ryan's record. That's like that's the record of his sort of outpouring of losing his father and the band and the, a lot of personal stuff that he was going through in his life. Um, that that to me is that that when I listen to that that brings back that's that I. That's the sonic. This might sound cheesy, but this is a sonic emotion. Like right, right, right. when I hear that, like that's what that dude was feeling. It's like a sad kind of kid. sad record, Som- something like that. Super, super somber, like super, like um, dense. Just a lot of stuff going on. Like, yeah, that's that's Ryan's emotions, and the way I perceive it, that's Ryan's emotions in the sonic form. Did you guys all take a like a note from that? Like whether it be Jeff lyrically or you you drums like drum wise, do you approach it like that too? Like more somber and sad than you normally would? No, I mean everybody approaches it a little bit differently. I'm a little bit more cerebral, where those two other dudes are a little bit more emotional. So when Ryan's bringing something to me, I'm like, well, how do I make this? How do I make this arrangement? How do I make the drums? How do I make everything? How do I tie everything together? How do I move from one part to another part? how do I make this dynamically go up and down? Like I kind of like, I don't know. I, a lot of people use the word artist, which I think is is just an overused word. I I call myself like a creative builder because I don't, I I think artist is such like an overly pretentious word. And that's how I look at stuff. Like my dad is a, is a carpenter or general contractor. So I, I, when I look at stuff, I'm like, how do I build the foundation? How do I fucking do this? I like, I I approach it like I'm building a house in, in my mind. So that's, that's, I feel like that's more of my role of like, Let's push it arrangement wise. Like, let's push it this way. Let's extend this. Like the drums should do this here. Like, I don't like for opposite. I used to write riffs and shit like that. There's, you know, opposite riffs that are mine, but I haven't written anything musically for Poison Well past that record because Derek and Ryan had gotten so good at it. Yeah. So I was just like, okay, that's cool. Like, that's really rad. That riff, like, where do we take it? And Ryan would say, I'm thinking this. And then I like, I would just kind of, you know, help Follow try to fulfill fulfill what his idea was i got you and like Um, make it the best i could build the build the best foundation for it for him to put on top you know i got you what him and jeff are trying to convey you know Mm -hmm. um and speaking of all the layering of other instruments and whatnot you guys tried to also do that with you come before you i i kind of wonder how different that record may be had you been able to do so with because i don't think you had enough time or something like that <clears throat> no, I th- I think we had enough time. I just don't think we were musically ready to go like the full the full distance. That you. was a major learning curve for us as a band. You come before you. That was like, oh, I need to become a better drummer. And Derek, I need to be a better this. And Ryan, I need a better better that. Like everybody had their individual. Holy shit, we just went from being like a little fucking nobody. Or people kind of care about band to like a real band. Yeah. Like there was a major learning curve with the making of that record and then the touring of that record where like we just had to step our game up. So by the time we had gotten to versions, I think that as musicians and as songwriters and all that sort of thing, I think we were ready to sort of go even deeper down that sort of rabbit hole, I guess. I get you. I get you. 
Uh, the last little thing about versions here, um, in the video for letter thing, you guys, mm. uh, you have these like, little like figures that are speaking in, um, uh, Norse subtitles. And I think yeah. what it says, the hour grows near the weak flesh shall be tempered by fire. Face what is yours with this ring. Mm-hmm. I thee wed. What is the meaning behind that? And does that have to, does that have to play into the whole, um, uh, Jeff, or I'm sorry, Ryan losing his father and everything like that, or, or no? So that, so in terms of like lyrically and like the visual creatives of the band, that was more that became more of Jeff's Jeff's sort of uh, domain when Derek left. Okay. So his he had the idea for that video in conjunction with the guy that directed it, this guy Robo Shobo, if I remember his name correctly. <clears throat> um, that may have just been lyrics that he had. Um. It may have something to do with him, or it just may have just been something that sounded cool that the director thought would work in conjunction. Um, even if you asked Jeffrey, even if he was here, he would say it's, he wouldn't reveal it. It's very much he leaves the lyrics up to your own personal interpretation because yeah, okay. they mean something to him, but they might mean something completely different to you. And he doesn't want to diminish what they mean to you and how yeah. you're interpreting it with his sort of, you know, um, perspective. Is he like that I with mean, a lot of his lyrics in general, right? All of them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all of them. All so there won't them, be like a, uh, beh- a VH1 behind the music uh, where he explains the lyrics at all anytime soon. No, nah, yeah, no, that would never happen. Um, so that brings us to the last record here, Tropic Rot. Um, mm-hmm. How was writing that in what is what used to be Ray's Downtown Blue uh, Blues, right? It was like a yeah, haunted, was... condemned and haunted bar. How was writing the record in that? It was cool, you know, like... Um... <clears throat> I was living in Miami at the time down in the design district and I would just take the train up. I'd take the trial rail up cause it li- literally just ran up and then you get off and you'd walk a few blocks and raise that's where Ray's was at. And, um, I think we kind of unified creatively. We unified creatively for the vision that we wanted. We're like, we want, we kind of sat down all together as a band that like we wanted. Like Ryan's like, I want it to be this. And Jeff's like, I want it to be that. And Brad's like, I want it to be this. And then I'm like, I want it to be that. And we got just kind of like, really kind of like put it all like in a pot. Whereas before we didn't really talk about it. We just had our own individual agendas. Maybe Derek would talk about the overall idea that he would have. And then we would just all interject. Whereas this was the first record where like, I'm like, I want this. And Ryan's like, I want that. And, you know, so we we were all on the same page. So Mm -hmm. we would step foot every day. So I think it took us about two or three months to write Tropic Rock from start to finish. And we were doing a pretty intense schedule. I think we're doing like four to five, maybe six days a week. Um, and uh, yeah, we would just go in there and hash it out. And uh, the environment definitely helped. It was free, which was kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> that's always really fun. that's always that's always cool because our our bass player Brad had a relationship with the guy that owned Rays, and it was condemned. And he's like, "Hey, is this cool?" And blah blah blah. So it definitely helped with the vibe in terms of writing. It was a really creative, cool space. Um, definitely weird, creepy vibes there sometimes. But anything weird and creepy happen? Because it's supposedly haunted. Uh, you know? I mean, I I remember at one point I felt like I got touched on the shoulder when we were at rehearsal, but it could have been a muscle spasm. Right, so I don't right. know. <laughs> yeah, it, you never could tell with those things. Um, yeah. So how was working with with Fair for those last two albums that you guys did, uh, which was Versions and Tropic Rot? Was that um, was that a pleasant pleasant situation yeah. or? Carl, Carl and his team are friends of ours from way back in 1999. So obviously going to Ferret made a lot of sense. Um, Wasn't a jealousy issue on Ferret or were they on Trustkill too? I don't know, to be honest. I think they, I don't think they were on either one. Eulogy. Yeah, they were on Eulogy. Yeah, they were on Eulogy. Um, no, it was great. I mean, uh, the money that we had gotten for versions versus the money that we got for Tropic Rock was like vastly different. <laughs> but this was also when the industry was doing this right, and everybody right, was right. just selling less and less and less. Well, so, Ferret's you know, also we, unfortunately not really around either, so to speak. So, yeah. Um, no, it was, uh, it was great working with them. I mean, Carl always had our back and, you know, he offers us a certain amount of money to do the record and we were able to make it work. Oddly enough, Tropic Rot, aside from, uh the first three records was the cheapest record to make yet it sounds the best in my years <laughs> well you know that's like a lot of that has to do with like just technology in general and like a you bit know and I mean? we work with somebody different like steve evitz is really good with getting good drum takes and getting good like 
you know, good mix and good everything. I mean, that to me is like, that's my favorite, that's my favorite Poison the Well record. When I listen to it, I feel, I, I feel like if there was a record to end on, that's the record to end on. Like, it, it sounds great. The, the songs are killer. Could be better in some ways, could be worse in some ways. Uh, but overall, I'm really proud of it. And I think that everybody, we, we had a nice, interesting batch of songs that had variety but still sounded like our band yeah. and did interesting things and i and me as a drummer i was able to cut loose a little bit more because of you know edits pushing me that's cool um yeah i was wondering if there's like any kind of beef between trust kill and fear i mean i never really heard anything or did anything like that but no no i don't think i don't think there was any issues at all like and not between necessarily them, between was... like you for you guys as far as like you being on trust kill one day and then like you know later on being on fair i just didn't know if they were because they were two of the big powerhouse kind of like hardcore labels back in the day yeah yeah no i don't think there was any beef i think at the end of the day it was it was business i'm pretty sure that carl and josh are cool for the most part there isn't really any sort of um beef yeah so. They do a uh, good fight now, right? Carl's on good fight, right? Yeah. 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 Carl does good fight. Um, so are you technically signed to anyone or are you just kind of like, I mean, poison the well in general? Nope. No. Okay. Yeah, no. Uh, um, yeah. No. I mean, we, we, like I said, we own our own records there. We license them to rise and rise is, is, you know, housing those, the, the you know, the Terra and opposite. Mm-hmm. And, um, technically we're, we could do whatever we want. I mean, there's been interest from labels, um, like I said, it just boils back to being able to get on the same page and deliver something that we all feel really good about. And this, yeah. So if, you know, if a label came to us right now and offered us a bunch of money, like we, we technically, if we had an EP or a full length, we, we would be able to sign. Okay, cool. Um, so these are, these next minuscule questions are just people, uh, that we haven't touched on yet that yeah, yeah, have yeah. sent in. So <clears throat> I'm just going to kind of like, do these really quick and then we'll wrap it up because it's probably going, yeah. it's like a two hour situation right now which is yeah, yeah dude which don't worry I, t- I, I anticipated it was going to be an hour and a half to two hours so cool. it's totally cool yeah well I'm, I'm very glad that you were able to you know spend this much time with us as well but um you kind of just you, you already just recently literally just top touched on it but uh your favorite album is tropic rod out of the whole discography is that is that because it's the latest one or is it just like the one you enjoy the most um i i well I think just because it's at, it's us at our best in, in every respect as like being able to play, being able to put songs together, production, uh, the experience of writing it, the experience of recording it. Um, I, it's, it's to me, it's the, it's the best version of Poison the Well, like that we left off on. Okay. You know? And um, actually what is really weird about having you on is we're currently working on like content for, uh, like YouTube and stuff like that for Lamb Goat. And one of the things we recently put up, like, hey, what is your favorite Poison the Well album? You know what I mean? We had all your albums and your discography yeah. up there. And uh, if you were to rank out of the five um, releases you guys did, uh, full lengths, uh, how would mm-hmm. you rank your own discography from like best one, to worst? <clears throat> one to five. Yeah. Um, I would do Tropic Rock, You Come Before You. Mm-hmm. Ah, this, see, this is weird. I know, I guess we're because it's like I don't, I don't identify musically with opposite, but I understand its value and its importance. So, if I were to rank it, I would say Tropic Rock. You, you come before you, opposite versions tear. Tear, I tear is the one that I least identify with. I don't okay. know why. I just, I don't feel much towards it. And then versions is just kind of weird. Uh, and then opposite, like I said, is not so much as a musical identification, but more so of um you know, an appreciation for what it did and the impact. And it's just like, that's cool. Yeah. You know? So mine would be, uh, mine is a coin flip on the first ones there. It, it, it depending on what day it is, it could be you come before you and it could be versions at my number one. Okay. It just could, could be, okay. you know what I mean? Whichever one. And then after that's that, pretty cool. you have tear. I'm not sorry. You have tropic rot. Then uh-huh. you have tear and then you have opposite just because opposite, I mean, again, like I, like you, I understand where it stands and what it stand, what it what it means, and all yeah. this, that or the other. But as your overall just piece of work, I think it's a beginning point, and that yeah. it should be number one. Uh, you know, it should be the last one on the list, I think, because you build on that. But I kind of yeah, just exactly. spoiler alert: that's my for the YouTube content. That is my <laughs> top five or the, the one through five. Uh, what's yeah. your favorite song to play, and what's your favorite song to listen to? That is yours. Um. So to play, I'd have to say 
Let me think about that. And this. that could be because the crowd gets crazy or you just like the way you play it. Generally, I ignore the crowd because, you know, I, I don't really, um, as being a drummer, I don't have to feed off of them. I'm yeah. just kind of in my own little world running my drums. Um, I'd have to probably say to listen to, it would either be uh, Cinema, Pompe Mousse, or Antarctica Inside Me. Okay. The three songs off of uh, those, in, in any order, at any point might depend upon my mood, but off of um, the Tropic Rot. To play, Crystal Lake is pretty fun to play. Yeah. Um, Ghost Chant is a really fun, uh, really like really fun to play because mm-hmm. we kind of changed it up a little bit. You know, we're like, oh, let's do this here and add this here. And blah. so the yeah, I'd say you, really anything off of uh, you come before you or Tropic Rot, like to to play. Yeah. For the most part. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, Pample Moose or whatever you want to say it was one of my favorites off of Tropic Rot too, as well as Cinema. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. Did you guys really play as a three piece uh, at Surf and Skate in two thousand two, two thousand three? Oh, I can't remember. Maybe. No, I don't think we would do that. Do you ever play as a three piece ever? No, unfor- we need like the. Se- it's all we. I don't think we've ever not played without a second guitar player, just because you need the like the fullness. I think at times, obviously, I think one time actually, oddly enough, again in Detroit, Jeffrey was sick, and I think we played St Andrews on tour with Hatebreed, if I remember correctly, and the crowd sang along. Like, Jeff was so sick, he oh, couldn't, cool. he didn't leave the van, so we just played, and the crowd sang along. It was awesome. I mean, I think, I think our merch guy, Rick, is just, like, holding the, holding the mic out in the crowd. Yeah. Those um, are, I always think about, like, how cool that might be for someone in a band to have that happen, just to, like, have the yeah. entire crowd sing the song without the singer being there, but... Well, yeah, that, that happened to us once or twice. Okay. And then... Cool. I, I, I guess you can make the argument with bass players because bass play, but we it took us forever to find somebody that worked with our chemistry, and most bass players that we had were pretty mediocre in playing, with the exception of a handful, where you know they're probably pretty low in the mix. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's like yeah. you and every time I, I die have bass player issues. It's you know it's funny because you develop a core of the band, and sometimes it's a drummer, sometimes it's a bass player, sometimes it's a hired guitar player, but you develop like a a three to four portion core. And then it's just revolving, a revolving cast of characters. And yeah. so you could find the one guy that either fits as a band member or you bring him on as a hired gun. And he just works in that role really well. And he's, yeah. he's cool with being in that role. Um, if you guys were to come, come back and make, and do a tour, what was, what's the ideal, you know, roster for that tour? And are you, are you uh, headlining that tour or not? Um, Depends. So I, I haven't really thought about this ever. So if we came back, the most ideal situation would be us headlining and then bringing one or two bands, two bands max. Like the idea of doing like a four or five stacked bill is like, like when we came back and played the show in Williamsburg, we played with Code Orange and they were the only opener and it was fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> only one band, like it, my ideal lineup would be us and another really cool heavy band that adds something and it's a two band bill. And that's it. And kids are there. So you're, you know, you're not right. like people are there like to see you or to see the other band or see both of you. Um, that would be the most ideal. Um, in another ideal situation, I do a co-headlining spot with a band that we're friends with. So it's like a lot of camaraderie and it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But they add something different. It's so like, say, us in a Thursday or us right. in a Thrice or something like that, where like the bands are sort of friends and, you know, Maybe some markets we headline, some markets they headline, but maybe, or maybe, you know, we co-headline, but we play before them every night, you know, right. something, something like that, something like that. And then you have one opener, uh, that's like a really cool band that just makes it a really well diverse package. And you're playing, we, you know, be playing anywhere between like a thousand to 3000 cap clubs. Yeah. So it's like not too big, but it's big enough to where everybody can see and the PA probably sounds good and we can bring, everybody can have some production. So it's not you're just watching some fucking dudes play on a stage, but there's like lights and maybe maybe cannons going off, maybe some fire. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah. it'd be cool to see uh, like if you guys were to come back. We already talked about Vein and Knock Loose, but like Turnstile, Vein, Knock Loose, you guys, or something like that, and that range yeah. range because like again, they're not that many like newer new metal, uh, not new metal bands. Sorry, I didn't know, what I said <laughs> that, but uh, metalcore yeah. bands that are really you know pushing the limits out there. Um, so yeah. my last little question here that I'll, I'll, I'll cut you loose after this. 
Why oh. did uh, Poison the Well and A Jealousy Issue never really tour together? I don't know. It just never happened, or <laughs> just, just never happened. I have no idea because we were, we were friends with everybody in, in in the band. There was no beef between anybody. Yeah. I just don't think we. I just don't think it ever came up. It just never, it just never happened. And it sucks because like Dwayne the singer, like Dwayne's a great dude. You know, other dudes in the band, like you know, I, I sometimes in New York I'll see Dwayne. He'll come to a show. Like he's a he's a he's a great fucking guy. But like it just never, just never really. This is never really materialized. Right. All right. Well, um, I got a lot of work to do here. I got to get on my change.org petition and start uh, start that around the hardcore community, so we guys can, uh, you know, get the, get everybody on the same page, so to speak. But yeah, do you have any other? It things? would be Go ahead. It would be hilarious if you do like a GoFundMe and like just make an obscene amount of money, like a million dollars, to get Poison to come back and make a record, and have then I can go to the that? rest of the. I, Wait, what? No, we, I mean, we do a label. We went through the, the crowdfunding and stuff like that. Because okay. at that point, you give you give the people that donated, they feel like they have a say in what you're doing. And I just know, like, to be honest, the only people I care about is the people I'm creating with and then whoever we trust to produce. Mm-hmm. That's really, like, the only people that I think that should have an opinion. But I think it would just be hilarious to do a GoFundMe and just get an obscene amount of money just, to, just like, as a joke, like, not that we would take it, not that anything like that, but just mm-hmm. be like, hey guys, like people donated like a million bucks to get or half a million road, dollars right? to, to get us back, to make a record and get back on the road. Like just as like, it would just, to me, it would just be really funny. Not that I think that we should cash out or anything like that. I don't think that's the right course of action, but it would just be hilarious because I don't even think that would move the needle. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> Interesting. Like I would be like, I'd be like, guys, let's make a record, and Jeff would probably be like, yeah, maybe, or he'd be stoked, or Ryan would be like, yeah, you know, it's just kind of like, yeah, you know. we've got to get something that just, interests everybody at the same time somehow. Some it would just, it would just be funny. Like I said, the, the, it's not so much a motivation of money. I just say that facetiously. Right, it's right, just right. Uh, it's, it would just be, it would just be funny that the story to tell. But like, yeah, they raised like half a million bucks, and we couldn't get our shit together. Like. Bop, bop. Yeah. Well, um, this is your last little bit here. Uh, do you have anything that you want to plug, or uh, do you? Are, who, what are you listening to? Anything that maybe you know we should be, you know, having our ear to the ground as well too, or or what what not? I mean, but, nothing that's like in the heavy domain. Like I'm not really like I like this uh, this dude from L. A. called Drab Majesty. It's mm-hmm. kind of like '80s, you know, like kind of synthy stuff. He came out with a new record that's really cool. Um, my friends in the Black Queen, you know. Greg and Asian Steve and uh, Josh, they released a record not too long ago. It's kind of like dark electronic music. That's kind of where I'm at a little bit more. Like yeah. I like, if I like heavy stuff, it's like kind of like, I like Cult of Luna a lot. I think Cult of Luna is a killer fucking band. Um, you know, Converge is always puts out quality. Like, oh, Mutoid Man. Mutoid Man's yeah. fucking fantastic, you know? Um, but these are things that people already know. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, if, I would suggest Drab Majesty, Black Queen. You know, anything, obviously anything from Utoid Man, anything from Cult of Luna. Like, I mean, I I think the most recent thing I was listening to was like Van Halen, <laughs> which I think everybody knows Van right. Halen. I don't need to. Van need Halen to or them. Van Hagar? Um, A little bit of Van Hagar, but mostly Van Halen, like the early Van Halen stuff, because it's just so like I never really got deep into Van Halen. And then for some reason, I just went down a YouTube wormhole of like. Eddie Van Halen and like what he contributed to guitar. And I, Mm -hmm. I knew Eddie Van Halen was like incredible, but I didn't realize a lot of people hold him as regards of like, there's Jimi Hendrix. And then there's a whole bunch of other people that did some amazing shit. And then there was Eddie Van Halen that like, I didn't realize that. And then they start looking, you are just like, yeah, I bought this thing and this thing. And I just started making, hear these sounds in my head. And and I came up with this thing and you're like, holy shit, that's fucking crazy. Yeah. And then you start understanding like the relationship between Alex and Eddie and I was, and I, and I've become obsessed with, like, uh, I've become obsessed with not snare tone, but like, you know, when you hear a band and the drummer starts playing, you immediately like the way their snare drum sounds, the way their their, their drums sound, you immediately know who it is. Yeah. I think Ben Kohler from Converge is a perfect example. He's one of those guys. He starts playing, and you go, oh, that's Ben. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I've kind of fell down that rabbit hole with with the, the Van Halen brothers. But like, dude, these dudes are so fucking brilliant in very different ways. And like when An- Alex Van Halen hits a snare drum, you're like, oh, that's Alex Van Halen. Yeah. So that's been my recent obsession of like listening and being like, how okay? Like I know when I hit the snare drum, it makes a certain sound and it's kind of associated with me and whatever degree. But like, how do I like turn that 
turn that up? How do I make it even more me? Right, 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 right. So I've been a little bit obsessed. With that. So the, the whole point is, yeah, I've been listening a little bit more Van Halen. Well, sometimes you got to drive 55 too, you know what I mean? <laughs> Apparently. I love also too, I, by the way, I love all the Van Halen brothers beef. Okay, yeah, the Van, it's, the Van, like, it's It's hilarious because you could tell they do not like David Lee Roth at all. They're like, okay, we kind of, we need the court gesture to come up here and like dance around like yeah. a buffoon because everybody loves Diamond Dave. And then, like, the beef between, like, Michael Anthony and Hagar, like, I think kind of Hagar was a little bit of a tool, but I've watched some uh, interviews recently, and he's actually a really cool dude. Like, he could tell he has, like, Michael Anthony's back. Like, he was like, I'm really bummed because yeah. they, like, they kind of, like, wrote Anthony out and did all this shit, and, like, yeah, you know, that was really fucked up. You know, you could tell he, like, really meant it. I was like, yeah, you know, uh, fucking Hagar is actually a pretty cool dude. And take it a step further, you can go on YouTube and you could hear Hagar in Toronto singing i think it's jump and it sounds awesome yeah i mean they wouldn't have made him the singer if they didn't think he could do any of that stuff too you know but i didn't realize it because i was never that deep into van halen that i thought they just cut it they're like okay well we might play might play one or two hits from the 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 roth era but like i thought they just basically just started and then just kind of you know started 5150 and then kind of went on from there but i didn't realize that they kind of did that they played some older stuff like you know like hearing hearing Hagar sing, uh, sing "Jump" is, is like holy shit! Like his range and his voice and the thickness and like it fucking works. And it actually kind of sounds a little bit better than than David Lee Roth. <laughs> Especially now, he David didn't age well. I've seen him recently, and he he didn't age too appropriately. I don't think. Did Did you see him on Rogan? <clears throat> um, I haven't watched that one, but I, that's on the list. There's so many yeah. of the, his uh, Rogan's podcast oh, man. I watch, but. There is only one David Lee Roth dude laughing at his own jokes every other minute. Yeah, that's good. I'm gonna like, check that out. But it's appropriate. You want David Lee Roth to tell some corny fucking joke and then laugh at his own joke for like a few minutes and then do like a do like a zabba to z. Yeah. You know, like that's what you want from him. And he fully delivers. I mean, after a while, I, I was like, I can't watch this. One. This guy's too ridiculous. <laughs> he's just a gigolo, you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah, dude. He's fucking the court gesture. Like he's the guy that like. <laughs> <laughs> this is another thing that's really hilarious. Did you ever see the video of Van Halen playing, I think, in like North Carolina, where the tracks for Jump um, were like a semitone off from Eddie's guitar? Like, mm-hmm. it, whatever, his guitar, let's just say his guitar's in D. I don't know if it is, right. but say if it's in D. It's like, the tracks, the, the, the synth part, it was like a semitone off. And like, you could look it up. I think it's like maybe Charlottesville or wherever the fuck, North Carolina. And they start playing, and instantly you could hear like the synth is like, that doesn't sound right. And then he comes in and it's fucking a train wreck. It's a total, tra- and you could hear, you could see him like playing shit. And then him like, like listening, like going close, like let's trying to listen, like what, what the fuck is off. Right. But back to the David, uh, David Lee Roth thing towards the end of the video, it's like David Lee Roth has no fucking idea what's going on. And towards the end, you can see how frustrated Eddie Van Halen is. And you literally see like on the opposite side of the stage, David Lee Roth, Writing a microphone like he's writing a dildo, <laughs> like he's like on like on not dildo like a like a horse, like a, like a, like a, like and, a horse, like a toy yeah. Horse. And, you, and I mean, it looks like a dildo because it's like a huge microphone. Yeah. So you're just kind of like that. The optics of that are just so like it's so fucking hilarious to watch Eddie Van Halen like literally have no idea what's going on, and David Lee Roth is just being Dave, like probably not even realizing like what's going on, and gets on the mic and starts writing them, and just like holy shit, this is. The most amazing train wreck I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah, it's really fucking funny. I definitely suggest anybody looking that up. Will do. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Just if you want to plug anything before you get out of here, before we cut you loose, go ahead. I, now is your time for the last little bit here. So I know you're on I'm tour not... with uh, with Danny and all them. Yeah, yeah. We're just rounding off the end of that tour. We've uh, been on tour for about a month, and we're doing 20 shows all together. It's a lot of a lot of days off, and we have about six shows, and they've all been kick ass, and it's been such a such a great time, and I mean, I wouldn't. I, I don't know if anybody's interested in seeing Danny or seeing Yellow, but that would be cool if they did, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it's not if you're interested in like what I do or whatever. Like I do, I do, you know, do session work. I do hired stuff. Like just go to my website, chrishornbrook.com, and uh, check out what I do in the videos. And like, if you want, I do. Like I said, I do lessons. I do sessions. Obviously, I do hired live hired live stuff. So. Yeah. yeah, well, we'll definitely link all that link all that in the description of the YouTube video and put it in the uh, info on the podcast uh, audio only stuff. But yeah, man, Chris, it was yeah. great having you on, brother, and it was Dude, great to be yeah. back, 
it's great that we got this long you know it's like two hours 15 minutes here which is probably our longest uh podcast yeah. here but i really appreciate it and it was very thorough no, and dude, man. informative man i loved it dude man uh thanks for thanks for having me man it's like for such the longest time like we always associate with lamb goat with like a site that hated us <laughs> and after a while it like fl- like it, it like flipped or like if you didn't get hate from lamb goat like if they started liking you then you were doing something wrong like right. you had to get hated by lamb goat right. but it's like i'm 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 you know obviously i'm being facetious of like oh no yeah, yeah. you know it, early early 2000s the of like, audience you know, I, I, the audience necessarily isn't this isn't really the website i should say you know what i mean because i think alex, no. alex and i both share an affinity for the band that is more so than just like casual liking you know yeah yeah yeah. No, it, I, but I, 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 like I said, if you're, if people aren't making fun of you on Lamb Goat, then you're not doing it right. That's yeah. my, that's completely my attitude. Like you're not doing it right if they're not making fun of you. Like well, I said, even with the thing when like, I think you guys covered when like I quit Census Fail, like all the comments were <laughs> hilarious. I was like, man, that's fucking good, man. Like I was just laughing at all of them because it's like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of true. Like, hey, you know, but it's like, good maybe. that you, you can take that, that kind of stuff in stride and chuckle at it and at yourself in some way too. Yeah. I laugh at everything. I have like a really dark sense of humor. Like I fuck with people, people fuck with me. Like none of that shit really bothers me. Like I like trolling, but I like trolling like in a very funny, like, like, Hey, no harm, man. I'm not trying to like make you kill yourself, but like a very like funny kind of jovial sort of like playful back and forth. That is what comedy kind of is too. You know, it's where it comes from. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So like when people do that, it's just like, I mean, obviously every once in a while there's like the, the fucking brutal, like, Yo, these guys just fucking kill themselves. Like, whoa, that's fucking. <laughs> I'm not finding really... any humor in that comment. Yeah. yeah, I was like, whoa, that got dark really quick. Yeah. All right, next comment, and then yeah. so you'll say something like something really fucking funny. I'm like, ah, it's good, you know. All right, man. Well, if you talk to the boys, let them know mm-hmm. uh, we send our best wishes wishes to Ryan and Jeff, and uh, you know, hopefully one day we'll sure. get you all on after a show sometime. Yeah, I mean, if all the fucking planets align and, you know, fucking, you know, Mercury isn't in retrograde and, I don't know, all the, all the superstitious shit is, like, where it should be, then, yeah, maybe we I, we definitely can, you know. We'll, I, we'll I, do I, what we can. We will do what we can, you know what I mean? Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll make it happen. <clears throat> all right, brother. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, and it was great having you on. I hope we have you on again sometime, man. Yeah, fuck yeah, whatever you want, dude. I'll, I'll or come in and talk about, you know, say funny shit about the band and tell funny stories and, like, because there's, there's a million of them. Yeah, well, we may be in contact about some other kind of content then later on. You never know, you know what I mean? Yeah. All right, brother, have a good day, and thanks again, man. You too, dude.